<clears throat> it's tick tock time to rock. Oh, we're back to that. Make sure that this thing is on. Oh, yes, Windows. <laughs> Thank you for that reminder. And it's the dude. I recognize your name in the uh, IP stream earlier. Thanks for joining again. Especially also you, Ewan. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so it's episode 11. <clears throat> and we're going to continue with chapter 5, but yep. we're up to verse 51. Dude! Tripper Gaming! Wait! Tripper Gaming! Were you uh, commenting on the prior Quran study stream? Or any of the streams? Yeah, I think it came in briefly the last time. I recognize the name. Because I'm just realizing... I, who I'm just realizing and remembering who you are. Um, awesome, man. Awesome. So, the guy that I uh, matched with on that other chat service thing, and... Narrow it down a little. Very narrowed down, obviously. But basically, <laughs> uh, Muslim, we had a really cool two-hour chat, and he was just interested to know more, and I introduce my channel so it's good to see you here uh oh um you're talking about the omegle chat yeah ah and now you've narrowed it down okay gotcha yeah yeah cool, cool. yeah so the reason why i was on that is because um there's a youtube channel that does sort of some sort of like ministry work and i thought i'd give it a shot just go on there and and i bumped into triple gaming so Yeah, I I really hope, I don't know how many of the streams you've caught, but I really hope that um, whatever you've seen so far, um, I've, I hope it's been helpful and eye-opening in some way. And that we haven't been too polemical in a yeah. an aggressive yeah, yeah. way. Yeah, We mean to be polemical, but from an intellectual position. Right. We admit, though, that we will sometimes go into the absurd sort of side of things. Yeah. And again, if you have any questions, feel free, like based on what we're reading, if you want any clarification, feel free to uh, message. Yep. But it's good to see you here tonight. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> so we're up to verse 51. It's going to load up all the other required content. Awesome, brother. Sweet. All right, so verse 51. You who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians as allies. They are allies of each other. Whoever of you takes them as allies is already one of them. Surely God does not guide the people who are evildoers. Yet you see those in whose hearts is a sickness. They are quick to turn to them. And they say, we fear that disaster may smite us. <clears throat> but it may be that God will bring the victory or some command from himself. And they will be full of regret for what they kept secret within themselves. But those who believe will say, are these those who swore by God the most solemn of their oaths, that surely they were indeed with you? Their deeds have come to nothing, and they are the losers. Uh, shall I keep going? Or yep. All right. You who believe, whoever of you turns back from his religion, God will bring another people whom he loves and who love him who are humble toward the believers, mighty toward the disbelievers, who struggle in the way of God and do not fear the blame of anyone. And that is the favor of God. He gives it to whomever he pleases. God is embracing knowing. Your only ally is God and his messenger and the, and the believers who 
observe the prayer and and give the alms and who bow it's probably that's a, probably the first time i've seen bow mentioned so far maybe that's the reason why they practice yeah. it yeah whoever takes god as an ally and his messenger and those who believe surely the faction of god they are the victors you who believe do not take those who take your religion in mockery and jest as allies either from those who were given the book before you or from the disbelievers guard yourselves against god if you are believers interesting so 57 is mm. definitely applicable with the youtube scene yeah <clears throat> when you make the call to prayer they take it in mockery and jest that is because they are a people who do not understand say people of the book do you take vengeance on us for any other reason than that we believe in god and what has been sent down to us and what was sent down for this and because most of you are wicked say shall i inform you of something worse than that retribution with god whomever god has cursed and whomever he is angry with some of whom he made apes and pigs and slaves of all type of foods those are in a worse situation and farther astray from the right way mm. so uh, very briefly, Nichols' comments, uh, 51, the seemingly friendly tone in the preceding verses toward the Torah and the Gospel does not carry over to the description of cus, cus, to, custodians, cus, of, custodians of those scriptures. Instead, a passage of polemic against the people of the book seemed to develop in verses 40 to 50 and to continue up to verse 86. In 54, this verse uses the verb itada, turn back, which is the most common verb for apostasy. Here, the, car, here the, the consequence of apostasy seems to be that Allah will replace those who turn back from their religion with other people who love him. This verse is also one of a handful of verses that mention the possibility of human love for Allah. Wait, this... Human love for Allah. Right. There is no command in the Quran to love either Allah or other humans. Mm. Right. Oh, wow, to love either Allah or the other human. Yeah, yeah. It's already been, wow. it was noted earlier, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in chapter 2 and chapter 3. And Allah never says he loves all humans. Yeah. Only doers of good and a couple of others. Um, yeah. Yeah. Both the few expressions about human love for Allah and the absence of any command to love Allah provide a rather stark contrast to the importance of love for God in both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. That the famous Shema of the Torah should not find an echo in the Quran is especially curious. Any comparison of the human relationship to God between the Bible and the Quran would certainly need to include this difference. Uh, I think we went up to 60, right? Mm. Yeah. So at 60, he finally says, Who are the people whom Allah has cursed? With whom is Allah angry? This verse is addressed to the people of the book and refers to people whom Allah made apes. The story about Allah transforming disobedient people from among the children of Israel into apes obviously appeared back in chapter 2, also later in chapter 7. Partly for this reason, most Muslim commentators interpret the phrase in verse, notice chapter 1, verse 7, mm. those on whom your anger falls to mean the Jews, mm -hmm. exactly as I said. Mm -hmm. the readers who would like a taste of Muslim interpretation of 1, 7 and 2, 65 and many other will find these ex accessible in... Ayyub's the Quran as interpreters and, and all that. Okay, so that's that. Spencer, yeah. starting on 51, Ibn Kathir explains, Allah forbids his believing servants from having Jews and Christians as friends because they are the enemies of Islam and its people. May Allah curse them. On 55, Guardian is Walaya. In Shiite Islam, this is known as the Walaya verse and is considered to refer to Ali ibn Abi Talib, designating him as the successor of Muhammad, that is, the guardian of the faithful. Sunnis reject this view. Is that the person who they accept over and above? I think it was Aisha or something. Um, I can't remember exactly what the... Like, after Muhammad's death, there was an argument about who was 
supposed to be the yeah, true I, successor. Yeah, and I, that's where the Sunnis and the Shiites fact. I don't know much information on that, mm. but that um, was like but that sounds that's similar. Roughly, yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, on sixty, <clears throat> a reminder that some of those whom Allah has cursed, him on whom his wrath has fallen, were transformed into apes and pigs. C two sixty three. Mm. And on Tagut C two two five six. six. Yeah. What was that one again? What was Tagut again? Uh, that was a unknown word or something. Two. two, two five, six. I can I can find it. Here we go. Two five six. <clears throat> yeah. It rejects Tagut. Uh, Takut is an Ethiopic word. Uh, it means shaitan or idols and can be singular or plural. Oh, okay, yep, yep. All right, so this is almost the, one of the kind of rarer passages that actually mentions the pagans. Mm. It's mostly a tirade against Jews and Christians. Yep. Yeah. And Reynolds on 60, so in 265, 7, 163, the Quran has God cursed the people who violate the Sabbath by saying to them, Be you spurned apes. And then he says, Go to Comtran, chapter 7. Which I'm presuming. I mean, I did I did do a deep dive, but in a prior stream, but uh, mm. I don't think Reynolds did a big discussion. I think chapter 7 is going to be a big one then. Yeah. Anyway, so in 447, the Quran alludes to the cursing of the people and has God tell and has God tell his audience to believe less than blot out faces and turn them backwards. Mm -hmm. Here, the Quran reports that God made Ja Allah people into apes and swine, but without any explicit reference to the people of the Sabbath. It is possible that the mention of pigs here is connected somehow to the anecdote of the Gerasene demoniac in which Jesus sends demons into a herd of swine. On the cursing of the Jews, see commentary in chapter 5. On the term for satanic entities, see chapter 4. I think because it's got apes and pigs, it's more referring to the that Jewish legend regarding... Which I did a mass as yeah, well. I showed, I showed the legend of the Shabbat. Jews thing. Yeah. 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 Because it has centaurs and all the other... Yeah. Yeah. Uh... <clears throat> So, Reynolds is on 64. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll go 61 down to 69. When they come to you, they say, we believe, but they have already entered in disbelief and will depart in it. God knows what they are concealing. You see many of them being quick to sin and en enmity and consuming what is forbidden. Evil indeed is what they have done. Why do the rabbis and the teachers not forbid them from their saying what is a sin and from their consuming what is forbidden? Evil indeed is what they have done. The Jews say, the hand of God is chained. May their hands be chained and may they be cursed for what they say. No, both his hands are outstretched. He gives as he pleases. What has been sent down to you from your Lord will indeed increase many of them in insolent transgression and disbelief. We have cast enmity and hatred among them until the day of resurrection. Whenever they light the fire of war, God extinguishes it. But they strive at fomenting corruption on the earth, and God does not love the fomenters of corruption. Had the people of the book believed, and guarded themselves, we would indeed have absolved them of their evil deeds and caused them to enter gardens of bliss. Had they observed the Torah and the Gospel, and what was sent down to them from their Lord, they would indeed have eaten from what was above them and from what was beneath their feet. Some of them are a moderate community, but most of them, evil is what they do. Uh... Oh, yeah. And, and so then, messenger, deliver what has been sent down to you from your Lord. If you do not, you have not delivered his message. God will protect you from the people. 
Surely God does not guide the people who are disbelievers. Say, people of the book, you are standing on nothing until you observe the Torah and the gospel and what has been sent down to you from your Lord. But what has been sent down to you from your Lord will indeed increase many of them in insolent transgression and disbelief. So do not grieve over the people who are disbelievers. Surely those who believe and those who are Jews and the Sabians and Christians, whoever believes in God on the last day and does righteousness, there will be no fear on them, nor will they sorrow. This last verse seems to be a little bit of a... It's kind of like what the like, Calvinists say when they're like, oh, don't grieve for the unbelievers. Yeah, but that notice Jews, Sabians and Christians can also be yeah. saved somehow. What does Sabian say about you? Indeed, increase many of the in instant transgression. What do you mean they can be? No, no, 69. Surely those who believe and those who are Jews and Sabian Christians, whoever believes in God and the last day and does righteousness, there will be no fear on them. So, yeah, it's so, like... so it's these people who have converted to Islam. Yeah, but I've. Uh, well, okay. Either that or we'll find out that that's yeah. been abrogated. It sounds like a Muslim would use that to say, see, you can be Christian now. Mm. Yeah. But there's definitely no universalist tendencies among strict Muslims. So. Mm. Mm. All right. Uh, did uh, Nickel have anything to say on it? Uh, oops. Yeah. Um, Nickel 64 and 66. So he says... Mm -hmm. uh, for 64, the Quran contains 24 statements about the kinds of people... Whom Allah does not love. So again, that same thing again. The, the object here is the corruptors. Had they observed the Torah and the gospel and what was sent down to them from the Lord. So the Quran's challenge to the people of the book to observe the Torah and the gospel is well taken. However, if what was sent down to them from the Lord means the recitations of the Quran's messenger, this is a matter for free discernment and response. Many Jews and Christians will deny the truth of the recitations of the prophet or the messenger by the, crit by the criteria of the Torah and the gospel themselves, not least when evaluating the passage of polemic. Just as above. When evaluating the passage of polemic just ahead. Mm. Right. All right. On Spencer? Uh, we're up to 69, so we're up to 70. Yeah. Spencer, go for it. Uh, on 64. Why don't the Jews' rabbis stop their evil behavior? Wait, 64. 64, yeah. Because it skipped it in the electronic version. Is 60 type hook? Yes, yes. And then 64 is just very long passage. No. Wait, what, what am I on? Um, are you still up um, in chapter two? Mm -hmm. Oh, now it's the table. table. Yeah. How's it chapter two. four? Scroll, 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 scroll. You're humming to the tune of my uh, washing machine. Scroll, <laughs> scroll, scroll, scroll. Isn't that a beautiful LG sound? <laughs> Remember that, uh, it's that TV show, that doctor hospital TV show. It's actually the Westminster Chimes so that we'll see. Well, I got it from that that TV show. Where he's like wrong, 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 wrong. Okay, well, I don't know what TV show that is, but that's the Westminster Chimes. Wrong, 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 wrong. Classically, it will play on bell towers. You're wrong. I'm right. You're wrong. <laughs> You're like that's. I'm quoting it. That's a meme. Anyway. All right. All right, number sixty-four. Sorry about that interlude, guys. Yeah. And my dagginess. None of us will quit our day jobs. We promise. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that is my ringtone. <laughs> yeah, Westminster Chimes. 64. Why don't the Jews rabbis stop their evil behavior? Yeah, scrubs. That's it. You got it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All 
I don't watch TV. I don't know no, movies. This is me as I don't a know TV shows. Young teenager. He knows all the movies. Yeah. All, yeah. Not all, but a lot of the TV mm. shows. I'm oblivious to everything. <laughs> <sighs> Why don't the Jews' rabbis stop their evil behavior? They even dare to say that Allah's hand is chained. It is unclear what Jewish concept, if any, the Quran is referring to in this case. Ibn Kathir comments. Allah states that the Jews, may Allah's continuous curses descend on them until the day of resurrection, describe him as a miser. Allah is far holier than what they attribute to him. The Tafsir al-Jalalain likewise says that in this the Jews are implying that he is unable to send provision to them and that he is miserly. The idea, however, that Allah's hand is not chained and must not be considered to be chained proceeds from the assumption that he is absolute will, unbound in any conceivable way. Allah's unchained hand is a vivid image of divine freedom. Such a deity can be bound by no laws. Muslim theologians argued during the long controversy with the heretical Islamic Mu'tazilite sect, which exalted human reason beyond the point that even the, uh, that the eventual victors were willing to tolerate, that Allah was absolutely free to act as he pleased. He was thus not bound to govern the universe according to consistent and observable laws. He cannot be questioned about what he does. Accordingly, there was no point to observing the workings of the physical world. There was no reason to expect that any pattern to its workings would be consistent or even discernible. If Allah could not be counted on to be consistent, why waste time observing the order of things? It could change tomorrow. Oh, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait for it. Oh, my gosh. This is, this is okay. very good. All right. Wait for it. Stanley Jackie, a Catholic priest and physicist, explains that it was the renowned Sufi thinker Al-Ghazali who denounced natural laws, the very objective of science, as a blasphemous constraint upon the free will of Allah. Al-Ghazali, although himself a philosopher, delivered what turned out to be the coup de grace to Islamic philosophical investigation, at least as a vibrant mainstream force. In his monumental attack on the very idea of Islamic philosophy, the incoherence of the philosophers. <laughs> the, uh, Muslim... This makes sense why Muslims react the way they've reacted on the streams yeah, okay. to me about science and the natural events of the real world. And... Yeah, oh, it's... Wow. yeah. So, Muslim philosophers such as Avicenni and Averroes, according to <laughs> Al-Ghazali, were not intellectual trailblazers worthy of respect and careful consideration. In posting that there could be truth that was outside or even contradicted, uh, out, sorry, or that was outside of or even contradicted what Allah had revealed in the Quran, they had shown themselves to be nothing more than heretics who should be put to death and their books burned. Al-Ghazali accused them of denial of revealed laws and religious confessions and rejection of the details of religious and sectarian teaching, believing them to be man-made laws and embellished tricks. He declared that the doctrines of Muslim philosophers such as Al-Farabi and Avicenni challenged the very principles of religion. Al-Ghazali said scholar Tilman Nagel was, uh, was inspired by a notion that we frequently see in Islam's intellectual history. The notion that everything human beings can possibly know is already contained in the Quran and the Hadith. Only naive people can be made to believe that there is knowledge beyond them. Which is a strange take because you require the knowledge of extra texts in order to... To then judge by the Quran. Which to means... actually understand the Quran in the first right, place. Right, right. Good point. At the end of the incoherence of the philosophers, Al-Ghazali reveals how high the stakes are. If someone says, you have explained the doctrines of these philosophers, do you then say conclusively that they are infidels and that the killing of those who uphold their beliefs is obligatory? He then concludes that they should indeed be pronounced infidels and therefore presumably be executed. Although, is although Islamic philosophy lived on, it was never the same. It had effectively been put to death itself. After Al-Ghazali and the defeat of the relatively rationalistic Mutazilite party, there was no large-scale attempt to apply the laws of reason or consistency to Allah, or therefore to the world he had created. Father Jackie explains, Muslim mystics decried the notion of scientific law, as formulated by Aristotle, as blasphemous and irrational, depriving as it does the creator of his freedom. 
The social scientist Rodney Stark notes the existence of a major theological block within Islam that condemns all efforts to formulate natural laws as blasphemy in, the, in that they deny Allah's freedom to act. The great 12th century <laughs> Jewish philosopher Moses Maimonides, Maimonides. Maimonides there you go, explained orthodox Islamic cosmology in similar terms, noting that Islamic thinkers of his day assumed the possibility that an existing being should be larger or smaller than it really is, or that it should be different in form and position from what it really is. E.g. a man might have the height of a mountain, might have several heads and fly in the air, or an elephant might be as small as an insect, or an insect as huge as an elephant. This method of admitting possibilities is applied to the whole universe. Oh, the whole universe. Rel relatively early in its history, therefore, science was deprived in the Islamic world of the philosophical foundations it needed in order to flourish. It found that philosophical foundation only in Christian Europe, bing, bing, bing. where it was assumed that God was good and had constructed the universe according to consistent and observable laws. Mm -hmm. Such an idea would have been, for pious Muslims, tantamount to saying Allah's hand is chained. Mm -hmm. The Quran also says that whenever the Jews light a fire for war, Allah extinguishes it. That is, says the Tafsir al-Jalalain, war against the Prophet. According to the Tafsir Anwar al-Bayan, the Jews make every effort to instigate wars against the Muslims, but Allah foils their attempts each time, either by instilling terror in their hearts or by their defeat in these battles. The Jews also strive for, cor for corruption on the earth, Basad, for which the punishment is specified in 533. Offenders must be killed or crucified or have their hands and feet cut off on opposite sides or be expelled from the land. So oh my that, god that's a lot no but that is like islam was like the first young of creationists yeah yeah and the first calvinists dang so it's interesting because we see christians of the calvinist and young earth creationist bent making very similar well the young earth creationists actually don't make statements like these because they're actually concordist in the flip sense. They'll create their own science and then make that science concord with the Bible. Whereas um whereas in this, this is a lot more like the Hindu the Hindu take where it's kind of a god like gods the, for the Hindus it's gods are within everything and therefore mm. they're they're manipulable. Um they don't have any um observable a sort of consistency because they they have gods and, and, and like these sort of agents mm. inside them mm. whereas the muslims in this take are saying god can do anything 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 so therefore trying to subscribe any consistency to the universe is tantamount to blasphemy because then you're just sort of chaining god mm. to um whereas uh well, the reasons the young earth creationists don't don't go that far and they'll con they'll concord their own kind of science to the Bible, is because of that that belief in Christianity that that God has a covenant with the laws of nature. Yeah, that, and I I disagree. I think young creationists have actually literally argued exactly that God can do anything. You you yourself have heard it from those debates that you usually have in a non like usually in a non cessationist. Oh, yeah. I've never heard a young creationist say that God aligned, uh, made a covenant with the laws of nature. I've never heard a young yeah. creationist say that. Which, which I'm going to show. But, but they do have what well, that they are trying to uh, categorize the world around them and see a consistency. It's just not consistent with actual science. It's consistent with their science. Whereas this is a lot more free flowing. It's like yeah, there are no observable laws. Ob mm. Observable laws don't exist because if there were observable laws and consistent laws, that would make Allah bend to to nature rather than the other way around. Yep. No. But well, younger creationists say that there's a, that God changed physics from one state to, to the next. That is true. Yeah, they did say that. Yep. That's not as intense as this. So when I when I ask things physics. like. No, the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. when I ask, okay, what was the sun doing pre-fall? Was it 
burning the way it burns today. Yeah. Yes, but there was no entropy. It was a different form of burning. Yeah. It, it, that makes no sense. So yeah. it's, it's like as if you're going from a Revelation 21 new creation physics to like present day physics, and then we're going to go back to Revelation 21 physics again. Yeah. Um, it is strange. Undevelopment team seems silly to take something you don't like as this limb's God rather than just understanding it as you see it. You could say that to anything, though, if you say God is light. The yeah. most consistent time that I see people say you're limiting God is um, when, yeah, when people are trying to be like, mm. yeah, open to science, I guess, and um, and open to um, current day um, miracles. Yeah, it, it's in rejection for those things. I'll just quickly bring up Jeremiah and Romans. Oh, and, and I think a little bit of the Calvinist take, which is like, oh, you can't have free will because then it doesn't allow God to be in full control. Yeah. Which to me, that's the most similar to this, this Muslim polemic. If, uh, if you say that, uh, humans have free will, then, oh, you're taking God's, um, extreme control over everything too seriously. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, not seriously enough. Sorry. Yeah. That's when I see that the most. All right. So in Jeremiah 31, mm -hmm. it's this language of, look, the days are coming. I'll, I'll make a new covenant, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And we usually stop at 34. <clears throat> What's look what happens in 35. This is what the Lord says, who gives the sun for light by day. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. My bad. Sorry. There we go. So Jeremiah 31, 35. This is what the Lord says, who gives the sun for light by day, the laws that govern the moon and stars for light by night, and who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. If these laws cease to function in my presence, then the descendants of Israel will cease to be a nation in my presence for all time. All right. So if the heavens could be measured and, and it continues on, but the point is the laws can't cease. When you go again to chapter 33, uh, it's a pretty astonishing statement. It says, um, if I had not established my covenant for day and night and the, now, especially the ESV has fixed laws, they're mm -hmm. fixed that govern the heavens and earth, then I might reject the descendants of Jacob and my servant Jake and my servant David by not taking some of his descendants and honor on God. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul does something very interesting in Romans one. He says, if I just skip down quickly. And here we are, Romans. Okay, Paul says. For since the creation of the world, God's, notice this, invisible attributes, so for clarification, his eternal power and divine nature, have been understood and observed by what he made, mm -hmm. so that people are without excuse. And that passage is like one of... That contradicts this. Yeah, yeah, but, but that passage is what scientists of, yeah. of the, um, what, like in the Enlightenment sort of ran with. When, when they were creating basically structural structural science, the science that we know was built on the foundation of structural science that was built on the foundation of the Bible. Yeah. It extended from Christian Europe. Um, and most of the scientists use passages, passages such as these um, and other ones that, can, that include, you know, Paul sort of saying, use all your knowledge and your wisdom, you know, to... Because apparently, so in other words, God is immutable. Mm -hmm. He's not arbitrary to free, like he's not chained. So in other words, mm -hmm. if I said Allah can't be Satan, yeah. by, by this logic, I've chained Allah. 
So that means he could be Loki if he wanted to, mm-hmm. and still be consistent with his nature according to this mm-hmm. um, context. But the God of the Bible is, is indeed an omni being, but he at the same time clarifies and says what categorizes ca- categorizes my omni attributes is that I also maintain an immutability about my nature, and if I'm going to have a relationship or, you know, if I'm going to create a divine council members, the universe, humans, Mm -hmm. there has to be a maintenance of the existence of these things in an, also in an immutable way, which is the whole point about say Hebrews one, he upholds universe with a powerful, with his powerful word. And so therefore the implications here is if I then if I want to see the fingerprint of God, all I have to do is look around around me uh, with respect to the laws of nature. And uh, and, and then um, if, if the laws of nature are immutable, then it's proven the, the, the Bible correct. And obviously it's proven the Quran wrong. You know what's really curious? I want to show folks this. Hugh Ross has just published, I'm not kidding, just a week ago, he's published a brand new blog post on exactly this. January 29th, 2024. (laughs) It's it's providential timing. Mm -hmm. Look at the title of this blog post. Bible got it right. Immutable physical laws. Let's just read this, shall we? In the 21st century, sometimes referred to as the post-truth era, people in growing numbers have begun to distrust science, scientists, and centuries worth of scientific research findings. Cases in which scientific data... Am I coming correctly? Yeah. Cases in which scientific data have been manipulated at or misrepresented for political or ideological purposes have led people around the world to question even the most firmly established facts. Today, a shocking number of people stand behind the claim that the world and all our solar system planets are flat bodies. Many claim that NASA astronauts never s- set foot on the moon or that the glorious images captured through space tel- telescopes are fake. A fundamental principle undergirding all scientific disciplines and endeavors is under attack. Various individuals, for reasons other than scientific ones, are suggesting that the laws and constants of physics may not be invariable at all times and places throughout the universe. See, th- this is mm-hmm. this is the dealing with that right now. Yeah, yeah. They question the very foundation of the scientific method and thus the basis for all scientific knowledge. My purpose in writing today is to counter this alarming anti-science trend by providing a thorough review of the latest, most firmly established measurements and observations upholding the, soli- the solidly affirming and solidly affirming the case for unchanging physical laws. At the same time, these findings attest to what the Bible declared thousands of years ago, a declaration that became a major stepping stone in my journey toward trust in God and his word. The Bible, in fact, gave and still gives impetus to investigating the natural world and trusting what our investigation reveals. It seems no accident of history that the scientific revolution exploded out of Reformation Europe, that's when and where, for the first time, the message of the Bible became more widely known to the world. Mm-hmm. So, let's do some science. No, nope, let's all do some science. <laughs> Wait, what? I can't read this out? I want to read it out. All right, go for it. He's just made the declaration okay. of a finding, so let's find out. All right, go all for right. it. The fine structure constant, oh yes, that's, that's what I'd like to hear, quantifies the strength of the ele- <laughs> making me laugh, quantifies the strength of the electromagnetic force interactions among elementary charged particles. Laboratory experiments using single ion optical clocks conducted over a span of one year showed that possible variations in the fine structure constant could be no greater than 3.9 times 10 to the minus 17 per year. That is crazy small. That's 17 zeros after the 0.0. Must be very small. 
This determination represents the most stringent laboratory confirmation to date on the unchanging nature of the fine structure constant. The fine structure constant governs governs it all, by the way. That's why it's called the fine structure constant. Mm -hmm. Further evidence comes from a natural nuclear fission reactor that operated two billion years ago in what is now Okla, Gabon. Calculations performed on fresh cores in the reactor, each with different uranium content, combined with measurements of the samarium-149 cross-section and the ratios of samarium-147 to samarium-149, established that changes in the fine structure constant and the strange quark mass over the past two billion years must be no greater than 1 into 10 to the negative 17 per year or 10 to the negative 18 per year respectively so that's that fits that's a correlation with the single ion optical clocks three japanese physicists conducted experiments on ultra cold so 140 micro kelvin or 0. 0.00014 degrees celsius above absolute zero photo associated this is basically uh, rubidium potassium molecules to potassium rubidium. Their experiments performed over a four year period show that variation in the electron to proton, proton mass ratio must be no more than 1.3 times 10 to negative 14 per year. Wow. Experiments based on comparisons of ytterbium and cesium atomic clocks established that the electron to proton mass ratio varied by less than two times 10 to negative 16 per year. The British physicist also magnetic stuff, 10 to negative 16. So each of these numbers from each of these tests comes as close to zero as technology allows or total confidence requires. <laughs> All right, I'll skip this bit, obviously. Apollo confirmations, because this is um, backtracking with the, the fact that we went to the moon and this is locations, reflectors on the moon, basically. And uh, let's see here. I thought the moon was a myth. See, Photoshop. When I so, look outside, all I see is the dome over me like the Truman Show. Well, Hugh Ross has now aided, given ammunition to the flat earthers, because see, not only is the moon a Photoshopped photo, <laughs> but he's decided to do Microsoft Paint on it in Hugh Ross fashion. It's, yep. So, it's um, all Photoshop. Everything you see here, folks, just made up. <laughs> just to clarify for anybody who doesn't understand Australian sarcasm, that was sarcasm. Right. <laughs> so, in a previous article, I explained how lunar laser ranging experiments have demonstrated the veracity of Einstein's theory of relativity. Theory that is cornerstone of cosmic origin models. And in a nutshell, basically, the gravitational fourth constant varies by no more than 10 to negative 14. Again, the electron proton mass ratio, same thing, 10 to negative All right, 14. So explain to me this as if I were a four year old. The variation yep. is such that. The variation of what? So th this is ratio. So the electron. I don't have four. I don't know what are lectures and ratios and blah, blah, blah. I'm full. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, okay, I'm not kidding. Okay, this, this is going to be a fun exercise. You ready, guys? You ready? I'm sorry, guys. So, the lattice structure of this mug and the lattice structure of the liquid in this mug is... In ex it it has its existence because uh, the 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 formation of the actual atom. So you have the nucleus, the electron. Obviously, there's subatomic part like the you know quarks, leptons. Gluons. I don't know what all of these things are. The, basically, oh. the building blocks. So think Lego. Okay. Okay. Think the big pieces of Lego would be your atom, and then the tinier, tinier, tinier Lego pieces would be what makes up the bigger pieces. So things that make the Lego. Yes. Great. Now, imagine you decided to, because this is how the laws are made, this is how Legoland works. Uh, imagine Legoland, imagine just a flat piece of Legoland. 
we'll cut we'll, so the grass yeah the, you know the green colored the Lego, Lego, Lego grass right now imagine that you place say a Lego mug that you made onto click like click yep now the, <laughs> click <laughs> now the click is because it's the exact the fine structure constant what is the fine co structure constant okay basically the lego land the little peg thumb the, peg thing the peggy bits that go will into go the exactly peg. as it should into the hole of that mug that just made yes all right now if i decided to import uh a different designer's lego land okay i'm like um mega blocks whatever and i'm like oh look it's it, it looks like the same mug but it looks a little bit different but same mug mm -hmm. different color yep i'm using color here deliberately because... using mega blocks because grandma was cheap and the hole looks yeah big enough okay it goes in but it it wiggles a bit. Yes, it goes in, but there's a slight wiggle. There's okay. a jiggle. Yep. Now, I'm using the mug there as an analogy of just one atom. Imagine now you're talking trillions of atoms. Trillions with, of Lego blocks. With wiggle room. Okay, yep. The whole, and then you create an actual. So it's made out of both Lego and Mega blocks. No, 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 no. You, we import a uh, uh, material that do not have the same constants as in this Legoland reality. That's why I said we bring in another, a d totally different Legoland. Oh, so we put in the mega nature. block. So, so the universe is Legos, and we put a mega block in. It. Right, but then imagine we construct. So we import trillions of them mm -hmm. onto Legoland fabric of reality. Okay, okay. At the whole, and then we build, say, the Death Star or the Millennium Falcon or, <laughs> yep. or the uh, F-14 Tomcat or what, just whatever. Or we, we do Oppenheimer's experiment, the, the Trinity Atomic Test, and, and Oppenheimer with the Lego land physics, yep. he applies it to that mega block, block physics. physics. Okay. But there's too much wiggle room. Yep. The, the, the atomic bomb won't go. It, it's... Yep, okay. There's two. There's... Okay, now now drive it home. We've set, All right. We've set the so, scene up. So, so the laws of nature are more precise. Okay, ten to negative seventeen per year. Oh, like I was about to swear. That's... So basically zero. Yes, is it's perfect. <laughs> it's more perfect than the manufacturers for Lego. Mm. So, in the, so I'm talking about the the original, the one that actually fits nicely. Yeah, the original Legos. The measurements for that mm -hmm. is crap mm -hmm. compared to the laws of nature. The laws of nature's its own hole and peg fitting is ten to the minus seventeen per year. So that there's much more no precise. changes. There are no mega blocks. There is no. There's. Lego. I, I would find more wiggle in Lego in the Lego manufacturers. Yeah, I mean, obviously. <laughs> Like, I, I would actually, that's, there's a statistical likelihood of me finding more wiggle than yeah. in the measurements we make on the laws of nature. There's okay. absolutely zero wiggle. Okay, so when you said we imported mega blocks, when you said we imported mega blocks into our Lego universe, that was, we, we didn't actually do that. <laughs> what was the function of that again? We, we imported trillions of mega blocks into the Lego fabric of universe. Yeah. Was that the theory? But it turns out that theory is bunk. Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. Okay, I no, got no, no. confused. What I'm, they're saying, give an analogy, and I'm saying... The analogy... The analogy is that I'm using other Lego, what, what do you call it, Mega Block, yep. as what Allah is, oh, okay. and what the young creationists are, right. because the fine structure... You need constant... to be careful, because you slammed an analogy into another two analogies. You're yeah, doing a no, Mark no, and Sandwich no, here. You're no. doing a Mark and Sandwich. What I'm saying... You've got... Half of analogy, shove in the other analogy, finish the first What analogy. I'm saying is, because the other one would be an arbitrary, different fine structure constant. Yep. Okay? Yep. Okay, let's just shove it in because Allah can do whatever he wants. Yep. Like, okay, but then if that's the case, you're going to have a totally arbitrary system where there's so much wiggle room, things will not work. I'm really sad, Rob. 
because it debunks Doctor Who. Fantastic. <laughs> I don't watch Doctor Who, except for the Daleks. Right? That's what I know. Anyway. <laughs> um. All right. Um. Yeah. So. Yeah. The fact that we can even have this discussion is because, is testament to the immutability of the laws of nature. Yeah. That's the point. So the building blocks are always perfect. There is no change in the building blocks. Nope. Maths would change. Physics would change. There's There wouldn't be any possibility for anything. The size of the universe wouldn't be the way it is. If it's constant in flux, like, oh, I've had a, like, a hiccup at, at this moment. <laughs> the comment section's hilarious. Oh boy, they is the internet unstable, guys? Or <clears throat> hopefully it's uh, it's just. Are you on? I'm on data, so that it doesn't interfere. Let's see here. Yeah. Oops. Oh, we've been pausing a bit again, apparently. That sucks. Maybe you got update. Updates. No, yeah. we did the updates just. What I'll do is I'll put it on that. Hopefully, it'll improve the. <clears throat> Dodgy Australian. It's a classic. Anyway, let's continue. Uh,. I'll, I'll I'll conclude. I'll conclude. I'll conclude. So so Hugh is basically saying way down here. Yeah, this this is ridiculous. Just look at this. So okay. any va any change, any variations over the last twelve point nine billion years, just the slightest variation is still ten to the minus seventeen per year. Um, so I'll skip to his conclusion. What's the implications here? Skip, skip, skip. The bottom line, which you nearly skipped. Where? The bottom line is that everything we know and can measure about the physics of the universe and Earth, sometimes to the 17th and 18th places of the decimal, confirms, even shouts, that the laws of physics have not changed. Speculation about small changes in the laws of physics is strictly hypothetical, not based on knowledge and understanding. The epoch that remains, as yet inaccessible to scientific observation and testing, is the initial 0. many zeros 2 portion of cosmic history. Mm -hmm. So thanks to the unwearing, dedicated and persistent and amazing theological, technological, technological tools, tools in their hands, astronomers, physicists can affirm the clear, repeated biblical claim that throughout the whole history of the universe and Earth, the laws of physics have remained fixed. That is unchanged. And by the way, you know that Romans 8 thing, the, yep. the, the law of decay, as Hugh keeps talking about, the yep. crop and bondage? Yeah, yep. That's the point. You can make a predicted or, or a predictable curve yep. if you have immutable laws. If the laws change, you can't make these yep. predictable curves of the chaos entropy states at any given time in the yep. history of the universe. Um, no other holy book accurately describes multiple facts of nature as centuries, millennia before they could be observed. Um, and here you go. He cites Jeremiah 33. And um, so if they remain unchanging, so too God's promises can be counted on. And here we go, Romans 8. Mm. Uh, slavery to decay or bondage to corruption right like and that. notice the ecclesiastes you know ecclesiastes nothing mm -hmm. on the sun mm -hmm. it keeps repeating mm -hmm. so ecclesiastes is the same sort of thing mm -hmm. um what yeah. we're saying is that the bible has been very consistent in saying that the laws of nature are consistent and also that there's no karmic effect where there's there's no like um if you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad. That's that's bunk in the in the the Bible has said no, that doesn't exist. The Quran, on the other hand, is saying um, that the karmic system does it is in effect 
to be fair to the Quran, I don't, I don't think that that um, that these particular verses go as hard as Al Ghazali. Um, I, I think that it just speaks. Yeah, but then it's a, it's a, it's a, a snowball effect. Like yeah. Chain reaction. Just that one verse, and it's. Obviously, for Al Ghazali, like I mean, we haven't got all the way through the Quran, but obviously for Al Ghazali, if he's like he has obviously gone through the whole Quran and he's decided that nothing in the Quran would suggest to him that there's any statement of the laws being um, consistent, and so therefore he sees this verse and he says, uh, "Nope, he bestows it as he wills. Um, yeah. So whatever he wants, he'll get." Uh, he'll get or, or or get as well. Um, so it's a little bit, um, which which is um. Even even with his Calvinist sort of bent, this Allah as a God has already predetermined heaven and hell for everyone. And as we go down further, it seems like you know, you know, it's even saying don't grieve the misguided or the disbelieving because the Lord has um you know, basically made them go either way. Mm. So, yeah, so so even even the Calvinists in Christianity wouldn't go so far as to say that God would just break all the laws. It, it, in fact, they're like the opposite. They're like, he's so fixated on the laws that he'll even fixate on sending people to heaven and hell. Whatever you do is all fixed. It's like, it's very, mm. very... That's what no, I would doing. agree with you on that because, yeah. because the Belgian Confession actually has that uh... Yeah. We look to the universe as an elegant book, yeah. uh, and then Galileus, ironically enough, around the same time, says, "Written in the language of mathematics." Yeah. So. So they're very. It's like like hard determinism all the way, um, but but from God right. rather than uh, like a humanistic hard determinism, mm -hmm. which would be strange. All right. So uh, moving on to sixty six. All right, one sec. All right, go for it. Sure. So, 66. The Jews and Christians are exhorted to follow what is written in the Torah and Gospel and promises paradise to those who do so. This is not, as it is often represented, a manifestation of ecumenical generosity, but rather an expression of the Quran's assumption that it confirms the message of the earlier books, which prophesied the coming of the Messenger. But it's hard for us to tell, as we've discussed in previous streams, whether they're talking about the books or Gnostic literature or, and other things. Mm. So it's it's hard to say because they there seems to be a, a confusion between the Torah and the Gospel and the Gnostic texts and the Jewish legends and, and commentaries. Mm. All right. Uh, 67. Instead of his message, the Wash Quran has his messages. Instead of, O Messenger, make known what has been revealed to you from your Lord, for if you do not do it, you will have not conveyed his message. The Shiite banker per man, uh, Quran manuscript has, O Messenger, make known what has been revealed to you from your Lord, that Ali is the prince of believers, for if you do not do it, <laughs> you will not have conveyed his message. Oh, wow. See 259 and the appendix. Oof, the... that's getting, uh, that's probably the most spiciest one for this. The, the Shiite. What is the uh, what is Ali? Ali, I'm pretty sure Ali is connected to. I I I think he's the successor to Muhammad. I think oh, okay. I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's very deliberate. And it's specific. interesting because I've noticed throughout um the two apocryphal Shiite surahs, uh, they have a consistent, um, like a messenger and his companions, mm. like his uh companion. Uh, his uh, family, sorry, mm. messenger and family through everything, where it will say messenger, it'll say messenger and family. And the Wash Quran constantly pluralizes everything. Mm. Mm. So. Uh, so on 68, Ibn Kathir explains that this passage tells Jews and Christians that they, uh, they will have no real religion until you adhere to and implement the Torah and the Injil. That is, until you believe in all the books that you have that Allah revealed to the prophets, these books command following Muhammad and believing in his prophecy, all while adhering to his law. Right. So that's that, um, 
Say, O people of the book, you have nothing until you observe the Torah and the Gospels and what was revealed to you from your Lord. What is revealed to you from your Lord is certain to increase the insolence and, and disbelief of many of them. But do not grieve for the disbelieving people. Yeah. Which is strange because it switches from, O people of the book, to do not grieve for the disbelieving people. So it switches from talking to yep. the uh, Jews and Christians to talking to Muslims in the same verse. And... um. Uh, like without those verse breaks in there, I think I feel like that would be even more confusing to be to be reading. Mm. So it's it and yeah, it's just strange that this is the eternal word of God that people believe in. <laughs> All right. Uh, so a very brief comment. So me two Reynolds says for sixty four. He says uh, Rudolph. So don't forget sixty four is in the context of. God's hand is tied up. Mm. Rudolf and Hirschfeld wonder whether the opening phrase of this passage is connected to Numbers 11.23, in which God asks, is the arm of the Lord so short mm. on the cursing of the Jews? Yeah, and that's that's ironic because the arm of the Lord language has nothing to do with... It was with a rhetorical immune. question. It's to do with what he's able to do with uh, mm. Joshua's wars and all that. Mm -hmm. Mm. But that's a good catch, though, on Reynolds point. Um, yeah. 60, let's see here. Uh, nothing until 72. Sure. 72 for Spencer yeah. 2. All right, so I'll go from 70 down to 81. For certainly we took a covenant with the sons of Israel and we sent messages to them. Whenever a messenger brought them what they themselves did not desire, some some they called lies and some they, they killed, they thought that there would be no trouble for them, so they became blind and deaf. Then God turned to them in forgiveness and then many of them became blind and deaf again. Yet God sees what they do. Wait, what? They thought that there would be no trouble for them, so they became blind and deaf. Then God turned to them in forgiveness, and then many of them became blind and deaf again. Yet God sees what they do. And, um, <clears throat> you want Spencer? Yeah, what, what does he say in 71? They thought no harm would come of it, so they were willfully blind and deaf. And afterward, Allah turned toward them. Now many of them are willfully blind and deaf. Allah is the seer of what they do. Mm. Now, Reynolds for 71 is... So, it's kind of as if they uh, turned, yeah, but... turned away from the Lord, then turned to the Lord, and then turned away from no, the but... Lord again. But, yeah, but Spencer doesn't have the forgiveness or grace sort of language. So, let's see. Turn toward them is a forgiveness language. Then... God turned to them, and then he clarifies in forgiveness. In forgiveness is in brackets. So. Yeah, I know, I know. But but Draj is trying to em emphasize the, the Arabic. Well, that's what it means. And and then many of them became blind and deaf again. Mm. So let's see Reynolds here. So Reynolds, they supposed there would be no testing, so they became blind and deaf. Thereafter, God accepted their repentance, yet again many of them became blind and deaf, and God watches what they do. Mm. Oh, so that's a little bit of a different rendering. So, so in other words, even though he accepted their repentance, yet again, many of them became, so it's God not doing the, the blinding. But the way Drudge translates it, then God turned to them, and, and then many of them became blind and deaf. Exactly. Anyway, that's interesting. So, 72. Certainly they have disbelieved who say, surely God, he is the Messiah, son of Mary. When the Messiah said, Sons of Israel, serve God, my Lord, and your Lord. Surely he who associates anything with God, God has forbidden him from the garden, and his refuge is the fire. The evildoers have no helpers. Certainly they have disbelieved to say, Surely God is the third of three, when there is no God but one God. If they do not stop what they are saying, a painful punishment will indeed strike those of them who disbelieve. Will they not turn to God in repentance and ask forgiveness from him? God's forgiving, compassionate. The Messiah, Sir Mary, was only a messenger. Messengers have passed away before him. His mother was a truthful woman. 
they both ate food. See how we make clear, clear the signs to them, then see how deluded they are. Say, do you serve what has no power to cause you harm or benefit instead of God alone? God, he is the hearing the knowing. Say, people of the book, do not go beyond the limits in your religion, saying anything other than the truth, and do not follow the vain desires of a people who went astray before you. They have led many astray, and they have gone astray from the right way. Those of the sons of Israel who disbelieved were cursed by the tongue of David and Jesus, son of Mary. That was because they disobeyed and were transgressing. They did not forbid each other any evil doing. Evil indeed is what they have done. You see many of them taking those who disbelieve as allies. Evil indeed is what they have sent toward sorry, evil indeed is what they have sent forward for themselves. That is why God became angry with them, and in the punishment they will remain. If they had believed in God and the prophet, and what has been sent down to him, they would not have taken them as friends, but many of them are wicked. All right, so that's 81. So Nickel from 72 says... Certainly they have disbelieved to say, surely God, he is the Messiah, son of Mary. So this actually repeats what we read earlier. So this, this verse repeats the Quran, striking judgment on the Christian confession to deity of the Messiah in verse 17. Mm -hmm. Here, as there, those who make this confession are said to disbelieve. In addition, this verse connects the act of associating shirk with the Christian confession, accusing Christians of associating a mere human prophet with Allah. On the name Messiah, I'll see that. Um, in this verse, the Quran also claims that the Messiah himself commanded people to worship Allah alone. The passage surrounding this verse is highly polemical. It attacks the beliefs of another faith and promises punishments for those it accuses of disbelief. The following verse speaks against belief in the Trinity, and verse 75 continues the denial of the deity of Isa. There, the Messiah is described as nothing but a messenger who proves his human identity by eating. <laughs> oh boy. It's funny because the the deity, like Jesus in the New Testament, eats as well as as God in flesh. And anyway, the, and God eats with Abraham. Yeah, yeah. In verse seventy seven, the Quran claims to determine the limits of Christianity. Interesting. Okay. Let's actually read seventy seven again then. So seventy seven says. Be with the book, do not go beyond the limits in your religion, saying anything other than the truth, and do not follow the vain desires of people who went astray before you. I see, okay. Um, the rhetorical emphasis and apparent confidence of these statements should not distract from the fact that they are merely denials of Christian beliefs. There is no new evidence after the New Testament, written some 600 years later, that would support the Quranic denials, nor did anyone hear the speeches that the Quran attributes to Isa. It is simply a disagreement about the identity of Jesus. It really boils down to that. Yeah. In 78, some verses in the Quran make the reader wonder how the reciter writer could have gotten Jesus so different from the gospel accounts. It is not just that Jesus made no such curse in the New Testament, but that Jesus' life went in the opposite direction. One of Jesus' best-known sayings from the gospel accounts is, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. The Apostle Paul, evidently writing from... Actually, so let's clarify. Verse 70 is, those are the sons of Israel who display were cursed by the tongue of David and Jesus. Mm, I didn't notice that. All right. Uh, the Apostle Paul, evidently writing from his knowledge of Jesus' teachings, wrote, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Mm. Paul also wrote, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is Aaron who is hung on a tree. Yeah. And at the end of the New Testament, the parting vision is of a city in which no longer will there be any curse. When when Jesus looked out over Jerusalem not long before his crucifixion, he spoke in the most tender way using a striking simile. Mm -hmm. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. One of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, so we're up to... Oh, there's also 81, sorry. Um, yeah. In 81... The Quran often seems to refer to believing in general without providing an object. In this passage, however, the required belief is in Allah and the Prophet. The characterization of Jews in the following verse, and indeed elsewhere in the Quran, 
may well be because they do not believe that the Messenger of Islam is a true prophet of God. The expression, the prophet, does not occur frequently in the Quran, and most of the occurrences come in Surahs Sur 8, 9, 33, 66. Here the Quran associates the prophet with Allah and declares that something has been sent down to him. And that's basically it. So, yeah. all right. Let me just line it all up. Yeah. Reynolds is... I'll read Reynolds after yours. Um, sure. Okay, Spencer. So on Spencer 68... Oh, did I do yeah, you did. You did go up to seventy-two. Seventy-two. Expensive. Seventy-two. The denial of the divinity of Christ and the oh yeah, and the labeling of those who believe in it as unbelievers is repeated. C five seventeen. Yeah. Seventy-three. The denial of the doctrine of the Trinity is repeated. C four one seven one. Jesus and his mother are again presented as the other members of the divine trio with Allah, but they were mortal. They both used to eat earthly food like all other people. Says the Tafsir Al Jalalain. Since he was like that, he cannot be a god because of his constitution and weakness and being subject to urine and feces. The actual Christian concept of the incarnation with Christ being both fully God and fully human doesn't enter into consideration. No. And we were talking about it last stream, but the beauty of the incarnation is that the profane and yep. the sacred are joined in one yep. in, in Jesus Christ. Hence the hypostatic union. Yep. The hypostatic union of God and God's creation um, has, was completed, and that means that is an answer to our sin, so the problem of sin and forgiveness and the ability of us to approach God who is so other that we would you know, burn up without that sort of mediator. You know, so finish your point. And it's also a um, an answer to the problem of uh, suffering and evil, well, particularly suffering and pain, because it's that 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 the creation is, as it was saying in uh, Romans, subject to the laws of decay. Um, but when God enters that, it's it's entering the laws of decay. And then in his death and resurrection, it's like that, it's that promise of already it has been raised to his level, but not yet for us. And, and then eventually, yes, we will be raised up to, to his level. Mm -hmm. New heavens, new earth, new us, you know, great, um, in that joining of, of the sacred and the, and the, and the mundane. Yeah. What are you flying? Look at this. Read. From verse three. From verse three. Well, well, just just verse three, really. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the form of humanity. He condemned sin by being incarnate. Notice that incarnate language. Yeah. In verse three. That's the whole point, Christians. Um, we we need the incarnation of God. In, in to our level okay now notice this notice because there's a weakness language that's the whole point we're subject to this reality mm -hmm. so god joins his nature to this reality to have a way out now i just had a light bulb moment which i thought before and it's reoccurred and so i could say it now on stream okay good coming back to the uh this is going to blow your mind coming back to the lego pieces okay If God marries his promises to his immutable nature, and then also at the same time basically says the universe operates practically the way I operate in the sense of immutability, like doesn't change. Okay, put that on the shelf for a moment. Now imagine Allah's universe is true, arbitrary. I can do whatever I want. Is the incarnation possible in Allah's universe? In theory, it should be. Because he can do whatever he wants. Yeah, yeah, but, 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 imagine, you see, the universe, yes, he can do whatever he wants, but then he'll have to be fighting his own Leviathan. Yeah. The universe is arbitrary then in the Islamic model. The laws are changing. The Logos incarnates into an ever-changing universe. Now, notice 
the, this is the Christian Logos. The Christian Logos is immutable. So the Christian Logos is like, oof, what? Oof, the, the body is now, ah. Oh. The atomic structures are suddenly changing. Like, in other words, yeah. there's this chaos. Within there's a no genuine hypostatic union. It can't happen. Yeah. It's too, the laws are too chaotic. You have to have an immutable system for the Logos to have an immutable hypostatic union. Well, it's not an immutable system, but it's a very consistent system. Well, yeah, because obviously it's not exactly zero. It is. Right. But the point is close to, very, very close it's to consistent. allow. Yeah. The universe is fine-tuned to allow the hypostasis, the hypostatic union to have happened in Christ the way it did. Yeah. Yeah. He does defeat chaos by becoming part of chaos, though, in a sense. Right. Right. But I'm just saying, I'm just... But it's, it's a like a life orderly, it's an orderly, it's an orderly chaos in, in, in the sense that when you give the chaos a purpose, it has a meaning. Because the... the just to just to summarize what i'm trying to say yeah. jesus well, got hungry jesus bled jesus died mm. what does it imply god in the incarnation is being consistent with the regular laws of nature as that human body was designed to be with and under and through and so on so god is like the driver of the vehicle that obviously that the bottleneck is the fact that it's a, it's the creation creature, mm. but being omniscient, he knows omnisciently know he knows where to pull the finite levers, so to speak. Mm. So that's why Jesus is perfect, but at the same time, he's not his body wasn't perfect like some uberman Superman. Yeah. But that's the beauty of that whole yeah. context. You need the verses that say what it says for the incarnation to happen. If we had a statement like what you just read in the Quran, theologians would have a a problem trying to marry the two mm -hmm. statements, incarnation and this verse. Yeah. I would say that um, in response to this comment, fine-tuned for the incarnation, I think actually God fine-tuned it for us, his creation. So his creation is fine-tuned. His incarnation was his gift to us to, yeah, to, to, say to, I'm, you're to not bring us back up to his yeah. level. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that God had a plan A, plan B situation. It's all his plan. He's created, he loves us, and then he goes into his creation and draws it to him. So so he's not only just arbitrarily loving us, he's demonstrating his love by, by yeah. drawing it. He also wants to be in a relationship with us. So he created us and, and the universe because he he loves the universe thinks it's all good and then loves us and wants us to to be in a relationship with him so mm. that's one of the beautiful things yeah about the christian doctrine okay there is none of that love language in the islamic tradition it's not love your enemies love your friends love your neighbors love yourselves love god it's um and that god loves us it's it's a flip of that, really. It's a, a subjugation and a slavery. Subjugate yourselves to one another, to God, to uh, all of these other things. Ensure that uh, God feels you subjugated under him. Ensure that your enemies feel themselves subjugated under you. Mm. Yeah. That's good. Mm. 78 is Spencer Disrepute. Repeating the verse, he didn't really add anything. Uh, else. yeah, he's just like cursed by Jesus and David for the disappearance. That's it. Yep, all right. So we're up to 82, so I'll line up there. Uh, Reynolds, uh, uh, on the crown's condemnation here, those who say God is the Messiah, see commentary in there, Jesus the messenger, see here. Yeah, so that's that's basically a phrase similar to. John Twain, like I ascend, but he he doesn't say worship. He goes, I ascend to your God, my God, your Father, my Father. It's adoption language. Mm -hmm. It's not denying Him as God. Mm -hmm. Seventy three. Um. Interesting translation. God is the third person of a Trinity. No, I don't agree with that translation. Yeah, that's pretty dodgy. Yeah. 
What was Spencer? 73 was... Uh, uh... Yep, he said, they surely disbelieve who say, indeed, Allah is the third of three. Yeah, the third of three. Yeah. They don't They don't have any concept of Trinity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they don't think that there's a triune God, in, like a tri-person yeah. God. They think of it as a tripartite God. Not, no, hang on. I've got that wrong way around. Tripartite God. Yeah, as in three gods. Or is tripartite? Tri tri theistic. Tritheistic. Yeah, yeah. 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 Tripartite, yeah. Most translation, uh, most translators, including Kure, imagine the Quran is here concerned with the Trinity. Yet the Arabic here is Talitha, Talitha, Talatha, literally third of three. Ah, so so he admits it's literally third of three, not. Trinity. Don't forget, this is not his translation. He's using some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that translation, he's saying no. The Arabic is saying yeah. third of three. Yeah. Yeah. This formulation suggests that the Quran's concern in this verse, as in the previous verse, is Christ. One of three persons but, of the Trinity. Yeah. In other words, 72, 73 should be thought of as one unit. In both cases, the Quran is speaking of those who declare that God is Christ. <laughs> Remember that reverse. Mm. Uh, Syriacisms in the Arabic Quran. Oh, see further, Griffith. Okay. Jalalain, thinking of 5116, comments that the Quran means to condemn those who say that God is one of three gods, which ironically Christians agree. Yeah. The other two being Jesus and his mother. Yep. Um, on the possibility of the Quran thought of a trinity of father, mother, son, I bet you he's going to go Gnostic with that. Yeah. Which is coming up in 116. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So. The Quran's understanding, from, from the way I read it, the Quran's understanding of the Trinity is that it was meant to be a tripartite God, so mm. three beings, three gods, therefore. But and therefore, this is not debunking Nicene Trinity anyway. So it's a straw man to take this. It is a straw man, but, but the interesting thing is you can take it as being a straw man, but I'm seeing it as people believe this to be the eternal immutable word of God. Exactly. And this word of God gets the Christian concept of the Trinity wrong. Yes. Now, if you were to believe... That's a straw man. If you were to believe that this is the eternal word of God, you'd have to say, oh, um, Allah is just straw manning it, you know, in polemics, which is a written, which is... A bad take because then you're saying that your god is really bad at debating exactly alternatively you can just say that your god got the understanding of the christian god wrong yes which is something you're going to have to grapple with yeah all right 75 Kare renders the arabic word here as truthful one based on the meaning of the arabic root in this he follows classical commentary such as double lane which defines it as extremely truthful it could be that with this, so 75 is certainly, and his mother was a truthful one, okay. It could be that the, with this term, the Quran is referring to Mary's honesty in regard to the divine origin of her baby. In the face of those who accused her of conceiving the baby in a legitimate way, in 6612, Mary such have confirmed the words of her Lord, it's also supposed of the meaning, it's going to the Hebrew and Aramaic to mean righteous or pious. This would fit the Quran's use of the same term to describe Joseph, Abraham, Idris on eating food as a sign of humanity. Uh, here, the Quran seems to assume that Christians consider Jesus and Mary to be divine, which is strong. Memory. Again, it's, it's the Quran's concept of the Trinity is that it's a tripartite God, which includes Mary as one of the beings not holy spirit right so it thinks that there's a father a mother and and a son yeah which again if you want to believe that this is the eternal word of god you can either say allah is straw manning the christian position meaning he's a bad debater or you can say allah got it wrong what the christian's conception of the trinity is mm. so allah misunderstood theotokos he understood, yeah, he misunderstood it big time. Because Theotokos. mother, mother bearing mother God, bearing God, mother of God, right? Does not mean that Mary had any of the omni attributes. Right. It mean it meant it's that actually... she was the mother of Jesus, who was God. Right. The there term... is no problem with that term. And yes, there are there are Protestants who just 
freeze up at this Theotokos thing, which is ridiculous, because if you deny Theotokos, then you deny, you deny that Jesus is God. Yeah, the, the term is used to defend the deity of Jesus, not the deity of the Bible. Not the Doesn't deity of Mary. <laughs> it's not saying that Mary is deity, it's saying that she's a mother of right. a deity. Which means the Quran is doing that exactly that yes. mistake. Because specifically, this is an incarnated deity. Incarnated right. through right. God, so... Um, okay, 76 you can skip. 78, the faithless among children of Israel were cursed on the tongue. Ooh, I wonder what Reynolds will say here. Literally, like, you and, like I literally know absolutely nobody who confuses the, the Theotokos term, except for Protestants who are deliberately confusing it for themselves. I, I don't, I've never come across anybody who's like, oh, Theotokos means that you're saying Mary is God. Nobody says that except Protestants who are extremely off-end anti-Catholics. Yeah. Did anyone ever believe Mary is actually God? No. No. You won't find it anywhere. You won't see it anywhere. Not even, even the, the most, Gnostics. Even the most... Yeah. Even I don't the think, Gnostics yeah, didn't I don't think yeah. that Mary was God. Like, it's just... Nobody has ever said... I haven't even heard Muslims say like polemically oh you believe mary is god unless they unless they're reading the quran and yeah, thinking through yeah, that yeah. but they're not thinking it because they've heard the word theotokos tossed around that's just a, that is that is a distinctly protestant issue yeah which is a shame because i think that you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. yeah uh okay he cites jabalane connects the mention of david's and Kojis cursing to five six explaining that the reference to monkeys there is connected to the story of the people of the Sabbath, and the reference to pigs there is connected to the story of the table from heaven. Uh, Ewan just clarified that, that his wording was confusing. But anyway, I wasn't having a go at you, Ewan. Sorry, it was just a rant that I had because I have had a discussion with a with a with a, a Pentecostal Protestant mm. <laughs> who was just couldn't couldn't handle the word Theotokos for some reason. Let me guess, the fine structure constant wasn't <sighs> fine enough. It's yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a Roman Catholic, by the way. Um, but I just, when it comes to, uh, like, high charismatic Protestantism, it's, it's yeah, I, I struggle. <laughs> I'd much rather dialogue with Muslims. The mega block. Too much bigger room, right? Oh, too yeah. much. Way too much. <laughs> As for. The reference to David in the present verse, one instead might note Psalm 109, traditionally attributed to David, in which the psalm curses his enemies. He had a taste for cursing, let it recall on him, no taste for blessing, let it never come his way. Regarding Jesus, one might note passages such as Matthew 23, in which Jesus condemns the scribes and Pharisees for their infidelity to their God. But the, the thing is, I would argue, in response to Reynolds, Jesus is not cursing anyone in Matthew 23. Um, he, there's a condemnation, but there's no cursing. And in regards to Psalm 109, let's see what Longman has to say on that. Um, I'll bring up the, the screen for us here. Psalm 109. All right, let's read it, shall we? So what was the verse? Uh, verse 17. For he didn't think to extend gracious love. He harassed to death the poor, the needy, and the brokenhearted. He loved to curse. May his curses return upon him. He took no delight in blessing others. All right, let's see what's going on here. So, context. This individual lament uses the language of the court and suggests that it was motivated by false accusations directed to speak, but the enemy is cruel, calculating. The psalmist describes him as weak, without the resource to protect himself. All right. Curse him. In these verses, the poet justifies his appeal to God to curse his enemy, who, after all, would, would just be receiving what he had wished on others. He gave no thought to helping others, so why should he be blessed? Cursing others was second nature to him. It was an integral part of who he was, soaking into him like water into the body or oil into the burn. 
Not only was it an inward characteristic of his personality, it was demonstrable by his public behavior. Um, this is not talking about the psalmist. This is talking about someone attacking the psalmist. Mm. So the psalmist opens and closes with praise for God, even though the body of the psalmist clearly lament in the midst of a great personal crisis where the speaker's friends have falsely accused him. Mm. He thus appeals to God to save him and bring judgment on his enemies. Even if the original setting of the psalm is the courtroom, the psalm can provide a model prayer for those being attacked by those close to, the, to them. David's greatest son, Jesus, found himself betrayed by his disciple, Judas. He extended friendship and love to Judas, but Judas repaid him with deceit and turned him over to the authorities who killed him. Peter cites verse 8. Oh, interesting. So this psalm is cited. May his days be few. May another take over his position in Acts 1 when, they're, when Judas mm -hmm. is replaced. Wow. So Peter cites this, the verse 8 of our psalm. Yep. In the context of the choice of Matthias as a replacement of Judas among the twelve. Yeah. Judas fits the description of the enemy in our psalm, and he suffered the punishment which the psalmist called on the one who had betrayed him. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body bullets over and all his all that. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I disagree with Reynolds there. In other words, now reading a commentary on that, yeah. the whole, it's actually the other way around. David is not cursing. Um, neither Jesus nor David are cursing. Okay. Reynolds, you stuffed up, man. Just only once, though. But so. in... Good record so far. <laughs> yeah, that's not too bad. But also, uh, in fairness, by chasing that rabbit hole with you know yeah i got mean, another yeah, depth like to hole. this an extra depth is that yeah. you know this is constantly reversing what what the bible deems to be good right what the bible deems to be good is not cursing people as exactly. jesus asked us yeah. to not do mm. um what the quran is doing is just constantly say curse them which is why when we see ibn kathir's commentary it's just mm. constantly <laughs> what was this other ibn kathir Ibn Kathir, quote, Allah states that the Jews, may Allah's continuous curses yeah. descend on them until the day of resurrection. Yeah. Describe him as a misa. Like, it's just honestly, it's just this constant, may Allah curse them. No cursing, YouTube doesn't like vulgar language. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know, yeah. I always thought that cursing was referring to like a supernatural thing until I realized that Americans use the word cursing for swearing. Oh, I was yeah, been swearing yeah. growing up, and then uh, yeah, <clears throat> that 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 was the other thing. I keep hearing America. I kept hearing Americans saying cussing, and I was like, "What is cussing?" Mm. And then I th I thought maybe, maybe that's swearing, mm. and then I was like, "Oh, it must come from cursing." <laughs> All right, I'm gonna read eighty two eighty six because Reynolds seems to have a big chunk for eighty six, so. Certainly you will find that the most violent people in enmity to the believers are the Jews and the, oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. The most violent are the Jews and the idolaters. Mm -hmm. Certainly you will find that the closest to them in affection to the believers are those who say, we are Christians. How can they be the most violent if, as it says in the prior verse, Allah foils their wars, their efforts to war? Mm. Efforts to battle are always foiled, so how can they be most violent? That's a contradiction. That is because there are priests and monks among them, and because they are not arrogant. When they hear what has been sent down to the messenger, you see their eyes overflowing with tears because of what they recognize of the truth. They say, Our Lord, we believe, so write us down among those who bear witness. Why should we not believe in God and in what has come to us of the truth? when we are eager for our Lord to cause us to enter with the people who are righteous. So God has rewarded them for what they said with gardens through which rivers flow that remain. That is the reward for the doers of good. But those who disbelieve call our signs a lie 
Those are the companions of the furnace. Again, it's, it's like repeating that same thing earlier. Nickel briefly says for 82, the Quran characterizes the Jews as the greatest enemies of the believers, while the Christians are the closest of them in affection. The following verses say that some Christians agree with the recitation of the messenger, and for that are rewarded. Quranic passages like this that portray the Jews in the most negative ways have the potential to fuel antipathy and even violence against Jews. The Muslim story of Islamic origins seem to support both negative thoughts and deadly actions with its episodes of the treatment of three Jewish tribes in Medina yeah. and its extensive portrayal of the Jewish rabbis. Yeah, very much so. Very unfortunate. But that's the unfortunate thing. If you are subscribing to this religion, then you sub and you subscribe to the fact that this is the word of God. Yeah. And it's just this constant tirade against Christians and Jews. Just, just constant. Um, don't believe in what they say because they're bad. They think bad thoughts of you. They want um, to laugh at you. They're laughing behind your back. They, you know, they laugh at your religion. They want to fight you. They actually hate you in their hearts. They say nice things to you, but they mean they mean ill. Just just constant throughout this whole book is is deliberately driving like this thought that the Jews are just and and Christians are just against them mm. intrinsically mm. yeah but 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 the doctrine of christianity is to love your neighbor mm. and to love your enemy so how do you like even if you were to create a polemic against another religion you need to at least use the the uh like go into that religious mind frame uh, and world view to see what they think of you and ironically if you delve into the christian texts and you find love your enemies love your neighbors mm. then that will give you a sense of oh well a christian there is therefore more likely if they're intrinsically christian and they really do believe that this is the word of god then they should be more likely to love you even mm -hmm. if uh you're an enemy of them yeah and yet, if I'm delving into the worldview and mindset of someone who believes in the Quran, mm. and I'm reading this text thinking, oh my goodness, this is their worldview, I'm starting to get a, 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 a frame of reference that is actually that the Muslim's first point of uh, understanding about me uh, is that I am their enemy. Mm that I think ill of them and that they are actually called to wage uh, a jihad against me. So a struggle against me, mm. which, which, you know, which is why I guess that, um, that the whole Islamophobia thing comes up because it's like a prejudice against a certain religion. Mm. And I don't think that prejudices against any particular religion are necessary uh, because Yes, there is uh, a mind frame that can be built up, a worldview that can be built up around your religion, but not, not everybody adheres to their religion to the fullest extent. Not everybody understands their religion. Not everybody um, interprets it in, in that sort of a way. So it's not necessary to go down that far. And, I, and I'm certainly not saying that I have gone down that far. Mm. But at the same time, when I'm reading this and I'm hearing what their mind, fr what their mind frame is supposed to be focused on, this is their word of God, mm. according to themselves, and it's just a diatribe against Jews and Christians constantly. Yeah. Okay. Go from 82. Sure. Uh, so, 82, where are we? You will find the Jews and the idolaters the most vehement of mankind in hostility to those who believe, and you will find the closest in affection to those who believe those who say, indeed, we are Christians. Yeah, so, and, and, you know, that is because they are among them, priests and monks, and because they are not proud, which is a strange statement to make, actually. Did uh, Nichols also make that statement? They are not proud? Uh, he hasn't, no, he didn't mention that. I think, I'm waiting for Reynolds, though. Um, yeah, okay. So, 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 yeah. so Spencer says on 82, Ibn Kathir explains why the Jews are singled out in this way. This describes the Jews since their disbelief is that of re rebellion, defiance, opposing the truth, belittling other, belittling other people, and degrading the scholars. Oh, there's a 
I think that comment is a mistake. But don't forget, leaving other people and just degrading. If you copy and paste it, up, don't forget there are mistakes like that in the Tufsia itself. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh yeah, it maybe it was. Yeah. Oh, who knows? Anyway, this is why the Jews may Allah's continued curses descend on them until the day of resurrection. Killed many of their prophets and tried to kill the messenger of Allah several times, as well as performing magic spells against him and poisoning him. They also incited their likes among the polytheists against the prophet. This is all <laughs> it's like conspiracy theory. Yeah. Meanwhile, according to the Tafsir and Waru Bayan, not all Christians are referred to in this verse, since many of them possess the same enmity towards the Muslims as do the Jews and polytheists. The Christians to whom this re refers are, the, are those who accept Islam. This is made clear by 583 and 584, in, in which those Christians accept the words of the messengers. Okay, so remember how last session we, we were talking about how this might have been the Jews that they're referring to may have been um, Jewish mystics. Mm. Yep, Kabbalah or something. Yeah, you were saying Kabbalah yeah, yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would they have done magic? I don't know. I don't think so. Because I think it was more like because Jews are actually prohibited to performing magic. Yeah, rites. no, I don't. I don't think they did that. So this is a very strange claim to make. We're either yeah. seeing anthropological evidence that Jews were mm. using magic, or we're seeing a mistaken identity here. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I know there are incantation spells mm. that have, ironically enough, the name Yahweh in it, or even the Christ name in it. True, but, these but they are, are very old. No, no, no. These are like a century or two after Christ, oh, okay. and, and they're like more so Gnostic type. Right, so that, more Christian Gnostics rather than Jews. Yeah. Not but the, Jewish sex. But it, but it's spells in regards to helping someone, ironically enough. It's not like spells to curse someone. Oh, weird. Okay. That's really weird. So I, 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 I have that in my mom commentary. So, um, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So it's, it, in other words, it's to, to try and imitate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exorcism and... Yeah. Oh. Um, MD Disc said, sadly, I've seen some Christians taking two passages to inspire hatred against Jews. Yes. And if they do that, well... It yeah. is very bad. It's a, it's a sin. It is, when I say very bad, it's like I was telling a child off. Yeah. But like, it's more serious than that. It's it's very serious and very, very, very bad. Okay. So I read up to 86. So Reynolds's next one is 88. Okay. 82 to 86. Wahidi relates four stories meant to provide a context for this passage. All of the stories involve the figure of the Negus, the Christian Negus, be ne Negus, I think. the Christian Ethiopian king to whom, according to medieval Islamic tradition, the prophet sent some of his followers in the Meccan period. In the first two stories, some of those followers, after they arrive in Ethiopia, recite a passage of oh, okay, Ethiopia would obviously involve magic spells. Okay, they're known for that sort of thing. Uh, Ethiopian Christians? No, 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 just that culture. Yeah, I wouldn't be. I, I'm. I'm presuming. Let's see where this goes. So, yeah. uh, in the first two stories, some of those followers, after they arrive in Ethiopia, recite a passage of the Quran to the Negus, and the priests and monks, accompanying him. And he's like, note the wording of verse eighty-two. So, if, so if you read eighty-two again, surely you will find the Jews and the polytheists. There's your Ethiopian, to be the most hostile of all people towards the faithful, and surely. You'll find the nearest of them in affection to the faithful to be those who say we are Christians. Um, that is because there are priests and monks among them, and because they are not arrogant. So these priests and monks would have been the ones that did the magic stuff. Yeah, but they're still talking about um, Christian and Jewish priests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, in other words, it's a, it's a, it's a mixed-up crowd. Yeah. And that's that makes sense if it's an Ethiopian context. Yeah. So. Well, that's why I said it's either a case of actually Jews actually performing magic, or it's a case of mistaken identity. Right. So, Wahidi continues, Whenever they read a verse, the tears roll down their cheeks due to the truths which they recognize. In the next two stories, the Negus sends some of his followers, priests and monks, to the Prophet in Mecca, who recites to them and passes the Quran according to one of these, the Ethiopian priests, and monks declare, how similar is this to what used to be revealed to Jesus? And begin to weep. 
These stories should all be seen as pious legends meant to to meant to explain the passage. Oh, okay. mm. Otherwise, this passage is meant to distinguish Christians, some of whom recognize the Quran's prophet from the Jews, who are categorically opposed to him. They are with the polytheists, the most hostile to the believers. Yeah, so, okay, I, I there was this big build-up thinking it's going to go somewhere. Apparently, this is all legend. Yeah. Then, yeah, the, 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 the Quran is stuffing around in the most... And they're having to make up legends like this to yeah, try and make sense do. of the passage. Yeah. Uh, okay. Which we see a lot, honestly. Let's see here. <clears throat> Ooh, 103 is Reynolds' is next one. 88 is Spencer. Yeah. All right, I'll go 87 to 96. Sure, yep, yeah, let's do that. So you who believe, do not forbid the good things which God has permitted to you, and do not transgress. Surely God does not love the transgressors. Eat from what God has provided you as permitted and good, and guard yourselves against God, the one in whom you are believers. God will not take you to task for a slip in your oaths, but he will take you to task for what you have pledged by oath. Atonement for it is the feeding of ten poor persons with the average amount of food which you feed your households, or clothing them, clothing them or the setting free of a slave. Whoever does not find the means to do that, the penalty is a fast for three days. That is the atonement for your oaths when you have sworn them and broken them. But guard your oaths. In this way, God makes clear to use his signs so that you may be thankful. You who believe, wine, games of chance, stones, and divination arrows are an abomination, part of the work of Satan. So avoid it in order that you may prosper. And by the way, Spencer clarifies, he uses the word idols instead of stones, mm. just to make it a little clearer. Satan only wishes to cause enmity and hatred among you with wine and games of chance and to keep you from the remembrance of God and from the prayer. Will you refrain? Obey God and obey the messenger and beware. If you do turn away, know that only... Know that only dependent on our messenger is the clear delivery of the message. <laughs> Something goes to our messenger. Interesting. So there is no blame on those who believe and do righteous deeds for what they may have eaten so long as they guard themselves and believe and do righteous deeds. And then again, guard themselves and believe. And then again, guard themselves and do good. Mm. God loves the doers of good. You who believe, God will indeed test you with some of the wild game with you, wild game which your hands and spears obtain, so that God may know who fears Him in the unseen. Whoever transgresses after that, for that for Him there is a painful punishment. You who believe, do not kill wild game when you are in a state of sanctity. Whoever it says on the pilgrimage here. Ooh, okay. Whoever of you kills it intentionally, there is. A penalty equivalent to what he has killed from the livestock, as two just men among you will determine it, as an, off as an offering to reach the Kaaba. Yeah, that's a pilgrimage. Or there is a penalty of the feeding of poor persons, or the equivalent of that in fasting, so that he may taste the consequence of his action. God pardons whatever is past, but whoever returns to repeat his offense, God will take vengeance on him. God is mighty, I take a raw vengeance. I will say, that's that's one of the best things I've, I've read so far in the Quran. Um, uh, in atonement for what you should not have done, you have to feed the poor mm. with the, with what you've killed. Yeah. That, that's, that's a good rule. Mm -hmm. Oh, you've done the wrong thing. Now you can... It's basically like you've stolen something, now go give it to the poor. Mm. Because yeah. you weren't supposed to do that. Yeah. That's, that's good. 10 out of 10. Yeah. And then finally, 96, permitted to you is the wild game of the sea and its food as a provision for you and for the travelers, but forbidden to you is the wild game on the shore, as long as you are in a state of sanctity, guard yourselves against God, the one to whom you will be gathered. And again, this is as long as you are on the pilgrimage. Yeah. 
All right, brief comments by Nickel. He says, um, from 87, here the Surah returns to commandments addressed to you who believe regulating such matters as diet, ritual practice, oaths, wills, wine, and games of chance. The transgressors are among the groups most frequently deny the love of Allah. The sense of atonement or expiation in this verse seems to be making up for unintentional failings to keep oaths. Um, here, wine is declared as an abomination. Um, again, do as good as of Jesus Allah's mm -hmm. love. The 97, the Kaaba is only... Wait, we did up to 96, right? No, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. All right, what does Spencer say? Uh, so on 90... So... 88. Oh, sorry, 88. The one who breaks an oath must, in expiation, feed ten indignant. It indigent. Indi what does it say on that one? I can't. In, in, indigence. Indi in feed ten indigents. In indigents, or free a slave. Mm. There is, however, no blanket condemnation of slavery anywhere in the Quran, or any idea of the of the equality of dignity of all human beings before God which led to an abolitionism in Christian contexts. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on eight, on 90, alcohol and gambling are Satan's handiwork and thus definitely, uh, definitively forbidden. For previous Quranic statements on alcohol, see these chapters. Since Islamic tradition regards this absolute prohibition on alcohol as having been re revealed later than, a, than the earlier, more qualified statements, this verse is considered to have abrogated the others. Yeah. yeah. 94. Um, 94. According to Ibn Kathir, Allah tests his servants with the game that comes near their camping area, or if they wish, they can catch it with their hands and spears in public and secret. This is how the obedience of those who obey Allah in public and secret become appa becomes apparent and tested. One thing I'll comment on is this, again, this is the eternal word of God supposed to be like the final message of, mm. to humanity. This this killing of domestic animals, uh, sorry, this killing of wild animals on a pilgrimage, right? Very cultural specific, mm. very situational specific. Yeah. I bet they did not foresee the industrial revolution and um, large scale <laughs> farming that we've got today. Right, 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 right. So... You know, uh, you know, for for the word of God to be so stubborn minded and so simplistic and so put in that culture, without any sort of, you know, a true prophecy would be like, oh, by the way, in the future when there's industrial revolution, blah 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 blah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Good point. That's so good I catch. mean, like again, like the Christians and the Jews have in the moment cultural things, but the point isn't like the rule in that moment the point is like the overseeing rule and the overseeing message and the theological message etc and the other thing is because it's god working in time with people across time we're not intimidated by it but this is supposed to be the eternal word of god dictated so it's meant to be like directly from heaven through gabriel muhammad and then to everyone mm. that's why it's a problem that's why it's a problem for Muslims, not for Christians. And yes, again, like the abrogation of verses. If the if, if the Quran is supposed to be so perfect, why are some pieces of it more perfect than the other, and therefore abrogating other sections? It doesn't make sense. This e this eternal ever changing book sure gets abrogated a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. And then this one, the best thing you've read. The bar isn't really high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh. All right. Yep. Uh, what else does Spencer say? Ninety. Oh, we just read ninety-four. Oh, uh, yep, ninety-four. And no, his next is one hundred and one. All right. But uh, we should wrap it up very soon, so we'll get to a hundred maybe. Okay. So. Oh yeah, Reynolds is hundred three. So. Mm -hmm. Uh. What what's Spencer's one? One hundred and one. Yeah, I'll just read. Okay. I'll just read. So we'll end it here from 97 to 100 is our final because Nickel has 97. So God has made the Kaaba, the sacred house, an establishment for the people. 
and also the sacred month, the offering and the ornaments. That is so that you may know that God knows what is in the heavens and what is on the earth, and that God has knowledge of everything. Know that God is harsh in retribution and that God is forgiving, compassionate. Nothing depends on the message except the delivery of the message. God knows what you reveal and what you conceal. Say, the bad and the good are not equal, even though the abundance of bad may cause you to wonder. Guard yourselves against God, those of you with understanding, so that you may prosper. And so Nicol in 97 says, the Kaaba is only mentioned twice in the Quran, both times in this surah, also 95. However, this verse seems to associate the Kaaba explicitly with the sacred house, <clears throat> an expression that also appears in a slightly different form at 1437. All right, folks. You know what? We're so close to the end. It's only 120. Shall we just finish it off? I'm I'm sure. All right, I'm, let's I'm, just finish. Let's, let's we can finish. speed run then. All right, sorry, folks. Okay, we're going to continue. <laughs> no, we'll finish chapter five. We'll finish the table. All right, go. Let's go 101 to. Let's say 110. So 101 to 110. Yep. You who believe. Do not ask about anything which, if it were disclosed to you, would distress you. But if you do ask about it, when the Quran is being sent down, it will be disclosed to you. God pardons it, for God is forgiving and forbearing. Oof, isn't that like a statement of saying that you shouldn't question the Quran? Mm. Do not ask about anything ask which, questions. if it were disclosed to you, would distress you. That is the most cult-like thing yep. I've read so far. Like, there's a lot of here where I'm like, yeah, actually, Talk about... Let's continue, and then boom, suddenly. Yeah, already. Oof. <laughs> Dang. All right. Keep, yeah, let's keep going. A people before you asked about it, and then they became disbelievers. <laughs> That's embarrassing, man. Oh, man. The, how do Muslims read that? I love that. that. A people then... before you asked about it, and, and then, then became disbelievers. In it. So in other words, if you question it, you'll suddenly stop believing it, because it's trash. I can't wait for Spencer's. A people before you asked, and then they... Oh man, that's hilarious. Oh, that's embarrassing. I'm going to remember... In fact, I'm going to highlight that specifically. That's hilarious. You said, yeah, start with 101 and then 102. That's crazy. <laughs> Oof. All right, keep God going. has. I want to see. Did anyone react to that? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Come, let us read them together. Versus, don't think about it, bro. Yeah. <laughs> uh, nothing to see here. Move along as I do. So even Ewan said that is not a good look. They asked questions and then left the faith. Oh yeah, that's the secondhand embarrassment. <laughs> I'm not even getting secondhand embarrassment. <laughs> Oof. It's so on the nose, it makes me feel bad for them. <laughs> but, the but I, I, I almost want to give the eternal word of I God almost... says, Don't question me, bro. <laughs> it's so bad. It makes me feel sorry for them. Like, I almost want to extend. The next time I'm going to talk like, to you, so I'm bringing this verse up. I, I almost want to extend them like a hand and, like, oh, I know that it doesn't really mean what it actually really means, <clears> just <throat> to cover up the sheer blatant embarrassment oh, that I'm seeing in this. <clears throat> <laughs> so, God has not appointed any Bahira or Seba or Wasila or Hami, oh. ha but those who disbelieve forged lies against God, most of them do not understand. Yeah, how convenient. Mm -hmm. It's because you don't understand. You just don't understand. When it is said to them, come to what God has sent down, and to the messenger, they say, what we found our fathers doing is good enough for us. <laughs> yeah, Jesus is good enough for us, mm. 600 years prior. Even if their fathers had no knowledge and were not rightly guided. Interestingly, it has a question mark. Even if their fathers had no knowledge and were not rightly guided. Yeah, I'll read Spencer's of, of 104. And when it is said to them, 
Come to what Allah has revealed and to the messenger, they say. Well, what we found our fathers observing is enough for us. What? Even though their fathers had no knowledge whatsoever and no guidance? Mm. I mean... Projection. But they had the texts that the Quran says was their guidance. Dude. And now they're saying, oh, they had no guidance. This whole this whole passage, Renal has a massive chunk on this. Uh, so, it's, anyway. It contradicts itself by saying that they had no guidance. Like, I'm assuming they're talking about the church fathers here. Ooh, good one. That's, that's, what, well, that's what that's I'm an assuming. Interesting, yeah, yeah, yeah. When it is said to them, come to what Allah, what I'm assuming is, what is said to them, in, in my brackets, the Christians, mm. come to what Allah has revealed, and to the messenger, they say, the, oh, hang on, they say, when, 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 and when it is said to them, oh, they say, yeah, okay, because it keeps switching perspectives. So now Muslims, they being Muslims, mm. they, and then the Christians say, what we found our fathers observing is enough for us. And then the Muslims say, what? Even though their fathers had no knowledge whatsoever and no guidance. Right. Th th that's kind of the dialogue that I'm assuming is going yeah, on yeah. just from reading that. And yeah. I'm thinking to myself that that means that the Muslims are challenging that their fathers had no knowledge and no guidance. But earlier in the Quran, it's saying that they did have guidance because they were given the book mm. and the, the Injil, the gospel. Yeah. They're given the book and the gospel, that was their guidance. Yeah. And now they're saying, no, no, that's not, they have no guidance, no knowledge. Which is also, you know, ridiculous. Yeah. The so... part about the fathers is no, I don't think so. Yeah, no. All right. So... Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, well, let's read well, the... Yeah. Let's so you who believe, look to yourselves, no one who goes astray can harm you. If you're rightly guided to to God is your return, all of you, and then He will inform you about what you have done. You who believe when death approaches one of you, you know what? Let's just stop at one of five. Yeah, let's get some to, clarification. To, to get the, the comments so far, so we saw one yeah. one to one of five. All right. Yeah. Uh, but Nicola hasn't said anything here. Okay. Well, we'll go straight to Spencer then. Yeah. So starting at one o one. Yep. One o one. This passage destroys the possibility of free inquiry in Islam in warning mus Muslims not to ask about the things which, if they were made known to you, would trouble you. However, the believers are promised that if they ask about them while the Quran is being revealed, they will be made known to you. It is odd that a perfect and eternal book would depend for its contents upon the questions of human, human beings at a particular time, but this anomaly is not explained. Mm. Yeah, uh, but uh, more disturbing for me is the fact that they're just not allowed to ask the mm, questions. Mm, if mm. something is bothering you, then you should be able to ask questions. And if it doesn't hold water, then I would be even more skeptical. Mm, mm. So uh, why would I subscribe to this belief? Yeah. Okay, 102. The believers are, again, warned not to ask, not to ask questions. As a people, before you asked, and then became disbelievers. Oh, sorry, a people before you asked, and then became disbelievers. Which may explain why international Islamic organizations, such as the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, are working so assiduously to criminalize and stifle criticism of Islam. Mm. I haven't particularly heard of that, but that's that's like one of Spencer's political takes, which is no, but I've seen not to be ignored. But I've seen, for example, Avery was doing that stream just yesterday okay. on TikTok. Okay. He's doing very well. Yes. And after what an hour discussion with a woman who is Muslim, yeah, um, she started showing doubts. Okay. I noticed this. That you can actually, you guys can actually check out the stream. This was just yesterday, and anyway, so she started to show doubts. A TikTok, then just cancelled that stream. Crashed. No, it just cancelled it and gave him a message saying. Um, that uh, this is causing yeah, there's no free expression of like in other words you're, you're changing uh, her views and it just summarize the the statement uh from a mass uh reporting so tiktok servers got a mass reporting right yeah, yeah. by muslims yeah and cancel the stream and so so but at least with tiktok he could yeah. reinstate the stream again but 
here you go. This is you have to wonder. But that that is, I mean, yeah. Warren no, I'm just I'm just giving an example. I'm not yeah, saying yeah, they're yeah, cognizant yeah. of this verse. Yeah. But it's in the Quran. Yes, it is. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I mean, but that yeah, that shows me that Muslims. And when I kept talking to you about that reset, yeah. that room reset and power talk days, yeah. like it's, it makes sense now. Yeah. So. 103, Bukhari asserts that Bahira is a she-camel whose milk is kept for the idols and nobody is allowed to milk it. Sa Saiba was the she-camel which they used to set free for their gods and nothing was allowed to be carried on it. Abu Huraira said, Allah's messenger said, I saw Amr bin Am Amir al-Khazai in a dream, dragging his intestines in the fire, and he was the first person to establish the tradition of setting free the animals for the sake of their deities. Wasila is the she-camel, which gives birth to a she-camel as its first delivery, and then gives birth to another she-camel as its second delivery. People in the pre-Islamic periods of ignorance used to let, uh, used to let that she-camel loose for their idols if it gave birth to two, uh, if it gave birth to two she-camels successfully without giving birth to a male camel in between. Ham was the male camel, which was used for copulation. When it had finished the number of copulations assigned for it. They would let it loose for their idols and excuse it from burdens so that nothing would be carried on it. And so they called it the Hami. Or sorry, it would have been Ham. And then Hami. Uh, Abu Huraira said, I heard the Prophet saying so. Okay. Yeah, what the heck is going on here? I don't know. So, one, three. That's Allah has not established anything the nature of a buyer. Or, but those who just feel better lie against. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's just saying. Okay. <laughs> Most of them have no sense. Yeah. I mean, I agree. Here I agree with, with the Quran. I remember like it obviously has God been. hasn't set up this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep, the Quran is uh, is correct. Even the, even, the, even the Quran's like WTF, man. What the heck is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's uh, that's pagan polemics for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is kind of funny. Um. <laughs> um. <laughs> All right, the next one's 110. So, Reynolds, with 103, which is about the sheep camel stuff. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Correct keeps four Arabic words untranslated in this verse because of the medieval Islamic tradition that the Quran is referring to particular camels mm -hmm. for which there are no English equivalents used for pagan rituals. Jalalin Constitution, which explains whose milk is uh, pretty much the same thing yep. you just read. Um... A certain copy of the female. Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, same that's, thing. Yeah, all right. Cool. It's it's fascinating to me because I like to look at the Quran from an anthropological point of view. It's fascinating to me seeing um like an ironic preservation of some of the idol practices, um, the worship practices of the people around these people in their culture. Yeah. Especially because unfortunately a lot of a lot of it was destroyed in in iconography sort of. Mm. Uh, icono, um, iconoclasm sort of moment mm. in, mm. in history so yeah alright we go from 106 down interestingly to... like the bible is fairly quiet about the practices of other, other religion religions around it isn't it no it doesn't really go into much detail about them it depends on what book you're talking about like I've noticed Daniel is very specific and yeah. very specific yeah uh okay i'm gonna go 106 down to say 110. um you who believe when death approaches one of you the testimony among you at the time of making bequests will be that of two just men of you or two others of the people other than you if you strike forth on the earth and the smiting of death smites you and detain them both after the prayer and let them both swear by god if you have your doubts about them, we will not sell it for a price, even if he happens to be a family member, and we will not conceal the testimony of God, surely then we would indeed be among the sinners. If it is discovered that they both were guilty of sin, let two others take their place from those who have been from those who have a rightful claim against the two former false witnesses, and let them both swear by God. Certainly your certainly our testimony this is I'm just so confused about this whole thing. You believe a death approaches one of you. Okay, anyway. 
Certainly our testimony is truer than the testimony of the other two, and we have not transgressed. Surely then we would indeed be among the evildoers. That will make it more likely that they will give testimony directly, or else they will be afraid that their oaths will be turned back after they have sworn them. Guard yourselves against God and hear. God does not guide the people who are wicked. On the day when God gathers the messengers, he will say, what response were you given? They will say, we have no knowledge. Surely you, you are the knower of the unseen. <laughs> That's a bit of a sassy reply back to Allah. When God gathers the messengers, he will say, what response were you given? We have no knowledge. Surely you, you are the knower of the, uh, of the unseen. All right. Mm. 110. By the way, you and was clarifying where I was sort of going with that. It does. Uh, the Bible doesn't want you copying him, so it does keep the vague, like vague descriptions of pagan practices for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't want it uh, like a copy of it continuing on. That's why it's sort of vague in that sense. Right. But it is very, very detailed in other sense, of, like of of what it's seeing. Mm. Okay, so remember when God said, Jesus, Son of Mary, remember my blessing on you and your mother when I supported you with the Holy Spirit and you spoke to the people while you're still in the cradle and in adulthood and when I taught you the book and the wisdom and the Torah and the gospel. Notice that book, wisdom, Torah, gospel. And when you created the form of a bird from clay by my permission and you breathed into it and it became a bird by my permission and you healed the blind and the leper by my permission. Yeah, it's got these by my permission notices because... Yeah. It's a very convenient. And when you brought forth the dead by my permission, mm -hmm. and when I strained the sons of Israel from violence against you, ooh. Mm -hmm. When you brought them the clear signs, those among them who had displeased said, "This is nothing but clear magic." Yeah. So it denies that last. The last part is uh is the denial of the crucifixion. Yeah. Interesting. So. Nickel only Nickel only has one ten as a comment. So he says yep. this second of three longer passages for the identity of Isa appears rather abruptly at the end of the surah. The passage makes a number of affirmations along with an influential denial. First of all, Allah says that he strengthened Isa by the Holy Spirit, literally the spirit of the holy. Isa speaks from the cradle. Also in chapter nineteen. Mm -hmm. Allah says he teaches Isa the Torah and the gospel. Here are four miracles of Isa mentioned for the second time, creating a bird out of clay, healing the blind and the leper, and raising the dead. Alongside a fifth, Allah brings down a table from heaven loaded with food for the disciples. Sounds like the feeding of the 5,000. Yep. One detail of verse 110 that many Muslim commentators have highlighted is expression, by my permission, mm -hmm. which appears four times. A similar expression comes twice in 349, by the permission of Allah. Muslim tradition interprets this to mean that Isa did not work these miracles by his own power, mm -hmm. but only by the power of Allah. Some Muslim commentaries specified that without this Quranic caveat, the listener or reader might conclude that these miracles are evidence of Isa's deity. Yeah, exactly. That's why they have to be in there, because mm -hmm. they have to try and avoid... Oh, you know, what if they think that this is his God because yep. he's able to do all these things? Well, yep. we'll put by Allah's permission in there as a convenient little caveat. Yep. Many Christians have been grateful that the Quran mentions some of the miracles of Isa and they apparently formulate listing of the miracles in the Quran. There's some similarities to Jesus' own description of his miracles in the gospel, mm -hmm. like Luke 7. However, the repetition of by my permission in 110 and by the pension of Allah in 349 goes against the spirit of the New Testament. The gospel accounts are more likely to describe the miracles as signs mm -hmm. of Jesus' glory. In most of the miracle reports in the gospel accounts, Jesus simply responded to human need with divine power. Still, it's interesting that Muhammad wasn't able to do that. Yeah. I mean, why is Jesus, you know... If the, he's just a mere human if prophet. If Jesus is the God of the Christians, and he was able to do these miracles by Allah's permission... Yeah, why didn't Muhammad do anything? Then why the couldn't Muhammad do anything? Yeah. A second detail in the verse, well, they'll argue the splitting of the, the moon. No, it's not, a, it's not a miracle because no one can verify it. Yeah, exactly. You can't do it when everybody's asleep. One, because the earth isn't flat. And two, because not everyone would be asleep. Yeah. And, and, if, and three, if you're going to do a miracle, it has to be in front of people so that they can witness it and verify, oh, yes, he did do the miracle. It right. doesn't count otherwise. Right. Right. Just be careful that you didn't knock that glass in. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> All right, a second detail in the verse that has attracted a great deal of interest, interest in commentary is the statement that Isa created. Yeah, that Isa created. Which that Arabic word is used for Allah. Yep. So elsewhere in the Quran, this verb is used only to describe the creative activity of God Himself, including 347, the immediate context of 349. The other two longer passages about Isa in the Quran are there. Okay, and that's pretty much it. So we've got up to 110, so 111 onwards. We're nearly finished. What does Spencer say at 110? Oh, he's, it's very short, really. Yep, the miracle of bringing clay birds to life does not appear in the canonical Gospels, but is in the 2nd century infancy Gospel of Thomas, although I think it was corrected by Reynolds what actual Gospel, what actual uh, thing it was called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of a bird, the water Quran has flying. Uh, uh, 140. No. Oh, we didn't get, so up, we didn't get up to that. Yeah, 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 that's his next thing. So Reynolds now. Yep. The Quran seems to set these two verses at the end of time. Oh. Whereas in 349, Jesus announces to the Israelites the miracles that he will perform. Here, the Quran has God speak to Jesus' miracles he has already performed. This apocalyptic setting is interrupted by the episode of the table, which is 111 to 15, but returns with the conversation between God and Jesus, begins in verse 116. On the Holy Spirit in the Quran, see that. The miracle of Jesus speaking in the cradle, though not in the New Testament, is found in early Christian texts such as Gospel of Pseudo Matthew. On the creation of a bird from clay, See that on the Israelite because if you perform magic, see that. Okay. Oh my goodness, on development team nailed it in a comment. <laughs> All right, let's see. <laughs> that is that is gold. What is either to tell a man his sins are given, to tell a man to get up and walk, or to tell people that you split the moon <laughs> when they weren't looking? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. That is a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a writer, by the way. Like this is. His his gift coming right through yeah comedy gold perfect man. absolutely perfect send me through your manuscripts <laughs> <laughs> all right uh reynolds all right do you want a cameo there we go come on <sighs> Say hi to everyone. Yes, you can stay there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here we go. I go one 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 to. Might as well finish it. One one nine. You and said it's a cameo. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cameo, cameo, eh? Cameo. <laughs> All right, let's finish it. One, one, eleven, two, All right, one, sorry, I'm getting so distracted, but it's like nearly 10.30 at night. All right. Remember when I inspired the disciples, believe in me and in my messenger, they said, we believe, bear witness that we submit. And when the disciples said, Jesus, son of Mary, is your Lord able to send down on us a table from the sky? Um, he said, guard yourselves against God if you're believers. Okay, um, Spencer says, uh, is your Lord able to send down for us a table spread with food from heaven? Mm. They said, we wish to eat from it and satisfy our hearts so that we may know with certainty that you have spoken truthfully to us and that we may be among the witnesses to it. It sounds this specifically so... like John 6, because oh, in yeah. John 6, yeah, yeah, there's is, this, yeah. they're approaching him again. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm the bread from heaven. This is just such a misunderstanding of what happened. It's Which, can I play that short thing by Gary Burge on John 6? Yeah, as okay. a closing, like a gospel message. Yeah, why don't we do that as a closing thing? We'll get through the yeah, next yeah, yeah, 15 yeah. verses yeah. and then we'll do Cause that. Because that, that was a really awesome little... It is. It was a 10 minute clip, so... Little, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, truthfully to us, so that we may be along the witnesses to it. Jesus, son of Mary, said, God, our... <laughs> Sorry, but... <laughs> It sounds like, like God. <laughs> right. Well, Spencer says, "Oh Allah, our Lord." Anyway, um, oh Allah, our Lord. Why is Jesus now speaking in? Uh, the... 
Our Lord, send down on us. A wait, wait, wait. Let's like think about that for a second. Our Lord, Jesus said, "Our." It, now he has the royal we. Yeah, true, true, true. So does he also get like the divine plural? Well, slipped up over here, surely. For goodness' sake. Instead of my lord, it should be, he says our lord. Our lord. Yeah. <laughs> God, our lord, send down on us a table from the sky to be a festival for us, for the first of us and last of us, and a sign from you. Provide for us, for you are the best of providers. Oof. God said, surely I am going to send it down on you, whoever of you disbelieves after that. Surely I should. It's like okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, <laughs> this is a very human emotion on Allah. Mm -hmm. It's like fine. I'll, I'll do this one more time, this trick one more time, okay, oh, yeah. just to please you guys. Surely I shall punish him without a punishment. Sorry, surely I shall punish him with a punishment, as with I have not punished, have not punished anyone, anyone among the world. The world. <laughs> oh my God! It's like. You guys, out of all the aliens out there, you guys are really just test, testing my patience. I punish him with a punishment with which I have not punished anyone of the world. I mean, isn't there a meme? Isn't there a video meme from a movie where someone says, oh, like... My. But like a kid movie, is what I'm thinking. <laughs> well, what you ask for Jesus, that tear my crunch. Oh, that's a good one. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Smite smite them. Them with a smiting. <laughs> I smote oh. them with a smiting that was unlike any other smitten smite. <laughs> the process. Sleep dep dep deprivation is not overcoming us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Remember when God said, Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as two gods instead of God alone? He said, glory to you. It is not for me to say what I have no right to say. If I, if I had said it, you would have known it. You know what is within me, but I do not know what is within you. Surely, which is interesting because the gospels say Jesus knows what was in them. Perfectly said through the lips of Satan himself. Notice how subtle that is. It's but I do not know what is within you. Not subtle at all. It is just blatantly satanic. But in the Gospels, it says Jesus knew what was within them. Oh yeah, like this is a this is like the most blatantly anti deity of Jesus passage yeah. that I've ever seen. It's not even slightly. Satanic. And then and then the clarification: surely you you are the noble mm Hmm. I only said to them what you commanded me, serve God, my Lord and your Lord. And I was a witness of them as long as I was among them. But when you took me, you became the watcher over them. Sounds, the watcher careful as well. Enoch, I'm not saying by that, I'm not going in that direction, but it's, it's, it's like, oops, watcher language. Wait, which verse was that exactly? 117. 117, 117. Yeah, watcher. Watcher is not capitalized in Spencer. Yeah. I watch it over them like I see them. You are the witness over all things. Yeah. Well, Satan was one of the watchers, just for clarification, and yeah, Allah fits that profile. Well, whoever's talking on behalf of this book is definitely mm. fitting. Yeah, the watcher yeah. speaking to Muhammad. Mm -hmm. If you punish them, surely they are your servants. If you forgive them, surely you are the mighty, the wise. God said, this is the day when their truthfulness will benefit the truthful. For them, there are gardens through which rivers flow. There, it's, this is gardens, rivers flows, like, yeah. how many times? Like 20 times we read it. There to remain forever. God is pleased with them, and they are pleased with him. That, that is the great, that triumph. is the great triumph. To God belongs the kingdoms of the heavens and the earth, and whatever is in them, he's powerful everything. It's like, for thine is the power, the glory. Yeah, it does like actually have that creedal sort of a yeah. taste to it, yeah. Okay, mm. I'll read, I'll just finish Nichols' comments. Yep. Um, Man, we are up, finished, finally, chapter five. How good is that? Um, let's see here. 
So I read that so one one three. The disciples ask Esau whether his Lord is able to send down table from the sky. They say that they are asking for a miracle so they may be certain about the truth of Esau's message. This detail is interesting because in the early years of the Arab Empire, when conquered Christians first heard the preaching of Islam, they asked whether the messenger of Islam had any miracles to his credit to support the truth claims of Islam. The messenger of the Quran is asked for a sign several times, including 6109. See discussion of verses that question whether the messenger performs miracles at 43 to 40. Mm. The word table in verses 112 and 114 occur only here gives the surah its name. Ah, so it's called the table. Ah, I see. Because yeah. of this. But I didn't even make that link for some reason. That's quite obvious now that I've So therefore, that. surah 5 mm. is the Quran's polemic against John 6. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Just by looking at it. But it doesn't look like a very good polemic because it, again, straw mans it. Because this has got nothing to do with what Jesus was saying. This this food section, yeah. The next bit, like the one seventeen or the one sixteen, one seventeen. That's very blatant. Yeah. Uh, one one six. Jesus, son of Mary, did he say to the people? So these three verses imagine a conversation in which Allah asks Isa whether Isa told the people to take him and his mother as two gods of sides, or instead of Allah. Ooh, that's an interesting one. Instead of. Isa denies saying this and declares that instead he only instructed the people to serve Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Mm. Finish the verse, by the way. It's, and my father and your father. Mm. Isa's statement and command here match several other verses in which Isa himself is quoted as denying his own deity. The second question that these verses raise is the concept of the Trinity in the mind of the reciter writer. 106 seems to suggest a Trinity of Allah, Isa and Mary. Yeah. A possible confusion concerning Trinity. In any case, other references of Trinity appear in 4 1 and 5 73. Yeah, the, like definitely the Quran's approach to what the Trinity is is that Father, Son, and uh, Father, Mother, and Son. Um, and, and, and again, like back to my original thing, if I were to subscribe to this religion, I'd want the God who is apparently speaking from all eternity to get. The polemics against the opposing religions at least accurate in what they actually mean because it's mm. not allah is, is creating polemics against something he doesn't understand which tells me that it's a human text dude look at this so mm. you know it says you uh but when you took me you became the watcher so nichols's final things here says but when you took me, the Arabic verb here, tawafa, is the same verb that causes the confusion mm. at 355. In all occurrences, not related to Isa, tawafa is commonly translated cause to die. Okay. And some translations render the verb this way here as well. Draj adds in death in a footnote. Perhaps in an effort to be consistent with Muslim beliefs about Isa, most translations render this verse mm. with expressions like when you took me. Mm. So that contradicts that's a contradiction that's a verse here so i was a witness over them as long as i was among them but when you so in literally in death mm. you became the watcher so jesus did die um ironically enough all right the next chapter is livestock it's gonna be your favorite well who knows spencer we uh, four. This has long been a, seen as a trace of Christian doctrine of the Eucharist. Ooh. Meh, I disagree. But Christoph Luxemburg sees this as much more than just a vestige. Uh, Jesus asks Allah that this table from heaven be a feast for us, for the first of us and for the last of us, and a sign, ayah, from you. The Arabic word Eid, borrowed from the Syriac, has been in conformity with its Arabic meaning, correctly translated by celebration or feast in the liturgical sense. The scholar of Islam and Jesuit priest Samir Khalil Samir explains that, according to unanimous scholarly opinion, the Arabic word Eid is a borrowing from the Syriac Ida, which identifies feast or, litur or liturgical festival, pointing out that this verse is the only place in the Quran where the word Eid appears. Samir concludes, this Maida table is thus defined by two terms, Id and Ayah, a feast or liturgical festival and a sign. Is this not the most appropriate definition of the Eucharist of Christians, which is a festive 
celebration and a sacramental sign. Uh, even more, it seems evident that in this passage we are dealing with a rather faithful description of Christian faith, otherwise not shared by Muslims. Luxembourg adds even more. The table being laid out, one could have thought, in fact, that the, that the passage was talking about having a celebration. However, the same writing or scripts trans transcribed in Syriac and pronounced Yada has the meaning liturgy. Thus, one must understand this verse as follows. Lord our God, send us down from the sky a last supper, which would be a liturgy for the first and last of us. In his reply, God says, I am going to send it down to you. Whoever is then impious among you will receive from me a, a torment, like the like of which I will not inflict on anyone else in the world. For the first of us and the last of us in 5114, is Li Awalina Wa Akhirina, another phrase found nowhere else in the Quran. Literally, it means all, nobody excluded. Samir relates this to the Christian litur liturgical phrase regarding the body and blood of Christ, which is offered for you and for many for the remission of sins. Mm. Okay, and, and that could see, I can see the creedal sort of ending in, so in 120. In so, in that. so 114 just quickly is. Set down for us a table spread with food from heaven, so that it may be a feast for us. For the so no, I'm, then it's not the five thousand. This is this is actually the last supper. supper. Wow. I I actually was thinking I was tracking on the same as you. I was thinking that this was yeah that John. Passage. We'll still play that clip because that is connected. Because but... because of the sent down from heaven sort right, of imagery, right, right, which is right. either like the manna from heaven, the, right, right, the bread right, right, from heaven, right. and then when Jesus is talking to the disciples, right. Um, in the conversation after they get on right, the boat, right, or whatever it was. But this is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So Luxembourg concludes: Islam was not impressed by this divine injunction with its threats of the most severe punishments, not having grasped its significance. If the Muslim exegetes had understood these passages as the Quran intended them, they uh, there would have been a liturgy of the Last Supper in Islam. Mm. Really. Mm. So if I click on 37 there, so apparently Luxembourg Christmas in Islam, sorry, Christmas in the Quran, um, I'm going to Google that. Who is this Luxembourg person? Yeah, I'm just going to Google that right now. Christoph Luxembourg. is a German scholar and professor of ancient Semitic and Arabic languages. Books, the Syro-Aramaic reading of the Quran. Dude, he's even been on... Um, so he's done a Syro-Aramaic reading. Kind of like what we're doing, but from the Syro Aramaic perspective rather than like a biblical. One. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. He must under understand more. Yeah, because I've noticed Spencer's been citing him a lot. True. And Christmas in the Quran. Interesting. So, viewed Middle East Forum. I'll have to. I'll have to. Uh, Look into this more. This is fascinating. All right. Uh, I think I would disagree with Luxembourg that the Muslims, uh, if the exegetes had understood the passages as the Quran intended them, they would have had a last supper in Islam. I don't agree with him that. I think the Muslim exegetes did have an understanding of it from the Quran's perspective, but I don't think that the Quran understands the Christian perspective mm, of it. Mm. Yeah, but see how it says feast or liturgical feast, pointing out that this verse is the only place where the word Edo appears. Edo, yeah. Is thus... Um, feast, liturgical festival. Is, is is this not the most appropriate definition of the Eucharist of Christians, which is a festival? Because don't forget, Jesus, it's on the lips of Jesus yeah. in this passage. Yeah. What other thing could be on the lips of Jesus in that in Christian tradition? Yeah, yeah. Um... But the but the problem is that the Quran is also denying the deity of Jesus. So why, by the way, why Jesus does it? look up to heaven and blesses the bread. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the from heaven bit, I think. Alrighty, on one sixteen, if you're willing to move on for yep. it. Yep. Allah asks Jesus directly if he asked 
his followers to take himself and his mother as additional gods along with him. Jesus, of course, denies having done so. Those who believe otherwise will be punished. Here we have not only a merely human Jesus, but a misapprehension of the Trinity. The Quran envisions the Christian Trinity not as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, one God, but a trio of deities, Allah, Jesus, mm. and Mary, yeah. which, yes, that, that seems to be very consistent throughout the Quran so far. So that means that, again, Allah, if this is the eternal word of God, either Allah is deliberately strawmanning the Christian faith as a polemic, which is a weak debating tactic, mm. or he is a misunderstanding the Christian take, meaning that it's written by a human, not by God. Mm. Um, yeah, right. that's all Spencer has on... And you've got Spencer's Cattle next. Cattle next. Well, it looks like Reynolds is quoting John 6. Just as I, you presume. So, yeah, yeah, interesting. All right, Let's so in verse 1 on 1, the disciples of Jesus... Um, so the Quranic word there comes from the Ethiopic word, Hawaii, meaning idiomatically apostle. Receive a direct revelation from God. This seems to contradict the Islamic doctrine that only prophets receive direct revelations. Hence, Jalain explains, that is, I commanded them by the tongue of Jesus. Hang on a second. Receive a direct word from God. Only prophets receive. Wait. One on one. And when I inspired the disciples saying, Have faith in me, my apostle, they said, Your faith is mm. Okay, that's a subtle little. Uh, <laughs> and commanded them by the tongue of Jesus. So, in other words, God took control of. So, Allah took control of Jesus' tongues or his mouth, basically. Because then that implies that Jesus would be Allah. Because if, if you read the verse carefully, you see, and when I inspire the disciples, but this is Jesus saying. Oh, yes. Good point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The Jalalin quickly runs the rescue. No, 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 no. Allah controlled Jesus' mouth in that moment. And made him, and made him command. Yeah. See. Yeah. Um, but then again, whatever Muhammad commanded, isn't that also what was supposed to be obeyed? Not Move quite. along, your citizen. Nothing to see here. <laughs> the episode of the table has the disciples make a demand for a sign from Jesus. Uh, the demand of Abraham in Jude 260. He is often imagined to be connected to the gospel passages on the multiplication of the loaves and fish, or the passage in Acts 10, in which she filled with animals for Peter to eat, comes out from the sky. In fact, it is closely connected to the, to the discourse on the bread of life in John 6. Excellent. So I will play that that clip after this. As in the episode of the table in the Quran, in John six, the followers of Jesus demand a sign, saying, "What sign will you do? Will you yourself do? The sight of which will make us believe in you. What work will you do?" Then the, they then refer to manna. Our fathers ate manna in the desert, as Scripture says. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Yeah, this is what I was thinking. Yeah. the bread coming from heaven, like yeah. the food coming from heaven. Shall we say? Yeah. John 6 is thus connected to Psalm 78, which laments the infidelity of the Israelites in general, and in particular their impertinent demand for a banquet in the desert during the Exodus. The word for banquet translates the Hebrew word shulhan for table. Notably, in the Ethiopic Bible, shulhan is translated ma'id. This presumably is the source of the chronic word al ma'ida. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, can God make a banquet in Ma the desert? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that seems like a lot more solid link than what Luxembourg was thinking. Mm, yeah. I, I, I think so. Yeah. From my reading of it too. Yeah. This is a more solid link. Mm. Especially with borrowed, like, loan words, yeah. essentially. Mm. Interesting. And it's also interesting that, once again, it's taking... Uh, it's like reading the gospel through the Psalms, which is what we've also seen the Quran do. Yeah. So the, the the Psalms and like the Psalmic lectionary of the Syriac Christian seems to be mm. heavily influencing the Quran. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um we are reading these from our own like the just the commentaries that we've sourced. We dip into the hadiths um and tafsirs now and then, but not all the time. Um it's not a matter of fairness because what we're doing is looking at the Quran. We're actually reading three different translations yeah, of the Quran. We're reading three different translations. And they are scholarly verified as well. We're looking at scholarship, we're looking at journals, we're looking at we do look at the 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 tafsir and the hadith. 
um, now and then, especially when something is like directly linked to the passages. Yeah. Not every passage has been linked to a hadith in in, mm. in our commentaries. Um, All right, that's yeah, that's let's finish up. So in Islamic tradition, the disciples are held to be faithful followers of Jesus. However, this passage, which makes the disciples similar to the crowds of John 6, suggests that they are less than faithful. And then, ooh, let's see where this goes. So that's it. He's finished with that. Mm -hmm. So 116 to 19. The Quran scenes... The Quranic scene shifts back to the eschatological hour as though the conversation between God and Jesus began in verse 110 is resumed. The issue at hand in this final passage of the surah is the eternal fate of the Christians, mm -hmm. which is left as an open question. According to some scholars, 116 suggests that the Quran, or more simply Muhammad, was influenced by the presence in the was influenced by the presence in the Arabian Peninsula of heretical Christians who believe in Mary's divinity. Some scholars justified this idea with the notion that in the Byzantine period, the Arabian desert was something like a refuge. Something. Something. Uh, this is type of the. Something like a refuge for Christians who disagree with Chalcedonian doctrine. To support this notion, scholars sometimes quote a tradition unreliably ascribed to various Byzantine historians that Arabia is. Heresy and Paris. The, the bearer, bearer or mother, mother of heresies. Of her or heresies. Others note the reference to Epiphanius's heresiographical her work Panarion to a group of women in the Arabian desert who considered Mary a goddess and offered her cakes of bread. Mm -hmm. Greek Colirida. For which reason Epiphanius names this group the Coloridians. Okay. Yeah, but then they are not. They're, they're just women in the Arabian desert. Yep. Not Christian. None of this speculation is necessary. 116 need not be a precise rec record of the record of the doctrines held by the Christians in the Quran's immediate context. Yeah. However, this verse does seem to suggest that the Quran's author thought of the Trinity as Father, Mother, Son, God, Mary, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. This conclusion also seems to be suggested in 575 and by the absence of any connection in the Quran between the Holy Spirit and the Christian teaching of the Trinity. The end of the verse, you know what is whatever's in myself is in myself, corresponds to the end of 109 in which not only Jesus but all the prophets declare, we have no knowledge, indeed you know best, all that is unseen. Uh, 117, worship God, my God and your my Lord and your Lord, is again connected to John 20. In John Christ speaks after the resurrection, whereas in the Quran he speaks apparently after God has raised him to heaven. Ah, that's a subtle little twist again. The following phrase, in which Jesus declares, I was a witness to them as long as I was among them, seems to be connected to John 17, especially verse 12. While I was with them, I kept those you had given me. Which, by the way, this verse, so John 17 is Jesus' prayer at the Passover. Yes. So it's funny. <laughs> There's a... Uh, should you name, I watched over them. Ah, see, I have watched... But Allah is the watcher. Yeah. And not one is lost except one who is destined to be lost. And this was to fulfill the scriptures, which is true. Again, the destined to be lost yeah. thing, by the way. The, this yeah. this uh, predestined sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. situation. Mm. And that's it. We're up to We're up the to cattle. Chapter 6, the cattle. Very good. All right. Time for... A quick um, 10 minute gospel presentation from John 6 from one of my favorite New Testament scholars. Yep. And then we'll close out. When we come to John chapter 6, we again are in this section of John's gospel that has to do with festivals. So let's just remind ourselves how John is built, um, and as I've suggested, 
An important interpretation principle is always knowing where your passage is located in the larger framework of the gospel. So even though John has two halves, 1 through 12 and 13 to 21, and the second half is devoted to the great sign of the cross, the first half describes Jesus' public ministry. And in that first half, we can see Jesus working um, in the context of Jewish institutions like the Temple of Jerusalem. And then we can see in the first half, Jesus working inside of festivals. And in another episode, we said, well, um, if you know these festivals, you're going to know what the keys are inside of the festival to make the whole chapter come to life. Um, so in chapter 5, um, you have to know <clears throat> how Sabbath works, what's prohibited on the Sabbath, what's possible on the Sabbath, um, and then chapter 5 comes to life. Um, but the other thing we know is that John is telling these stories in order to use codes inside of the festivals as a springboard for understanding Jesus more clearly. And in chapter 6, this is enormously evident. It is enormously evident. Um, not only do we need to read John chapter 6 as a marvelous feeding miracle, this is where Jesus feeds the 5,000, and so therefore in the drama of John's gospel, here we are listening to this story at one simple level. Jesus feeds compassionately 5,000 people who have need. Um, we also know that it's Passover time, and so that also is a part of the story. Now, the question is, does John want this to be a sign that will press us to a secondary level underneath the story? And indeed, I think that's the case. Now, in order for us to understand these codes, we have to go back and remind ourselves of some of the things going on at Passover. It's a springtime festival for Judaism. It's the beginning of the harvest year. Um, this is an agricultural moment where we're thinking about, in Israel, how green grass is coming back and how the harvests uh, are, are ready to begin to be cut. Um, uh, lambs are being born inside of your flock. This is a wonderful time of year. Life is coming. Life is coming back to Israel after a long winter. So Passover in springtime, I have to keep that in mind. The Jews not only talked about um, the agricultural aspects of these festivals, but they also talked about the historical or you could say biblical aspects of these festivals. Because Passover is not simply um, sort of in your agricultural cycle, it, remind, it becomes an opportunity for me to remember what happened in the Exodus uh, from Egypt. So if you recall, um, the Israelites over 400 years are in Egypt. Um, the Israelites um, are led out of Egypt by Moses who uh, uses you know 10 plagues with Pharaoh. They flee through the sea. Um, and in their flight, they have their final meal, which has unleavened bread with it. They are protected by the blood of the lamb, which goes over the doorposts. They go into the wilderness. They spend three months in the wilderness. It's a desperate time. They're worried about water. They're worried about things to eat. And God sends them manna. Um, and so therefore, every morning they wake up and this heavenly bread, they thought of it as manna. Manna means, what is it? That's what it means in Hebrew. Anyway, so they ate this manna. A quail flies in. They're able to have bread and meat. After three months, they make their way to Mount Sinai. And this is where God reveals himself uh, through Moses. All right. Now, on the way to Mount Sinai, of course, they're not happy all the way. They have doubts about whether or not this is a good program. Some of them are complaining, wondering if they should go back to Egypt. Even though they were slaves, they had something to eat. So murmuring is a part of the story as they go. So what are the threads? There are many threads that I can pull through this story. There's At Passover, I can talk about manna because it's the miraculous bread that God provided in the wilderness. I can talk about how God led them through the sea as they escaped from Egypt. I can talk about that. I can talk about the murmuring of the Israelites. Even though they saw the great sign of God, they still murmured. There are many things here inside of the Passover story that I can look to. So when I open John chapter 6, there are some things that John wants to tell about this Passover story. So the first thing that I see is that Jesus meets these 5,000 people um, here uh, in the first 14 verses. And when he feeds these people, I recognize at once that we are looking at a, a miraculous uh, a miraculous feeding miracle, it is. And it's a miracle that has to do with bread. Jesus even has them sit down in companies like Mark describes in Mark chapter 6. And it looks almost like a shepherd with sheep who's taking care of them here on this green grass. Now, you would think that this is all that John wants to tell us, but of course you know by now that John does not want a simple story like that. He wants to tell us more than this. Because if you look at verse 15, something dramatic and disturbing happens after the feeding miracle. Um, the crowd is frenzied. They're excited about what they've just seen. There's a great deal of talk in Judaism at this time that when the Messiah comes, he's going to be like Moses. And therefore, if he's like Moses, he's going to duplicate something of this feeding miracle. And so therefore, is this a sign that the new Moses Messiah has actually arrived? Well, if Moses has returned and he's the template for the Messiah, then perhaps this new Messiah, Jesus, is going to do some of the things Moses did. And does that mean that as Pharaoh was defeated in Egypt, so likewise the Romans might defeat, be defeated? This is, suddenly becomes an explosive and dangerous moment for Jesus. Look at verse 15. Perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew into the mountains. What in the world is going on here? It seems as if the people who have just witnessed this entire event now want to co-opt the ministry of Jesus. They want to hijack what Jesus is doing in order that he will serve his agenda, their agenda. Now, keep a hand, keep, hold on to this notion of king, because here they want to make Jesus king in their terms. But when we get to the trial of Jesus at the very end of his life, we're going to discover that indeed Jesus is a king, and it's going to be the principal term used at his trial. He is a king. So therefore, the question is, what kind of king is he, and who is it that, needs, who, who is it that really needs to be enthroned? All right, so we have the feeding miracle of the 5,000 here, which is our initial part of the story. And then in 15 through 21, we discover that Jesus sends them away from the crowd. They go out into the sea, and then they discover Jesus at night when it's dark. There's a strong wind that is blowing. They are afraid, and they witness Jesus walking on the sea. 
Now, you might think that this is an innocent story in which they are encouraged that Jesus is walking on the sea, but this is the very language that is used in the Psalms to describe how God led his people out of Egypt. They were walking on the sea. Remember, they opened the sea, which meant they were walking on the seabed. And it's described in the Psalms as walking on the sea. So what Jesus is doing is duplicating some of the significant events which are hiding inside of the Passover story. But it's verse 20 that I want to bring you to because it's so critical in all of John's gospel. It's one of the first times we have seen this. When they see Jesus, um, they wonder who he is. They are frightened. And Jesus says, it is I, don't be afraid. There is no translator that can ever bring across into English what this does in Greek. Um, inside of the Old Testament, when Moses meets God on the top of Mount Sinai, God reveals his personal name. And in Hebrew, that is Yahweh. It, is, it means I am who I am. Now, when that phrase is translated into Greek in the Greek Old Testament, they had a translation of it at this time, it takes on a unique English uh, Greek form. It is in Greek, I, emphatic, ego, and then the verb to be, ami, ego, ami, I am. That is the divine self-revelation, self-designation of God inside of the Passover story on Mount Sinai. So they see Jesus coming and they say, who is he? He's afraid, they're afraid, they're wondering. And Jesus simply says, ego, ami, the very words heard by Moses. Well, you can imagine, all of this is just echoing things coming out of the Passover. Are we witnessing in chapter 6 the rebirth of things happening at the Passover? All right. Now, of course, the crowd, they're wondering about this. They're curious. And so the Jesus and his followers end up back in Capernaum. And I imagine they're in the synagogue. And they ask, are we actually seeing what we think we see? Are we seeing that you are replicating what Moses did in the wilderness? And then here in verse 30, they say, what sign do you do? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So, therefore, they're asking, is this the miracle of bread? Now, we have to take another tangent. Because even this Passover story about bread in the wilderness became such a, a valued and treasured story. It evolved over time so that rabbis are, re are reflecting in Jesus' day, how did Moses do this? How, how did he, was he able to feed everybody? And so they speculated. They speculated that in heaven, there is what's called the treasury of manna. It was, think of it as a large box. And Moses' righteousness was able to open the box every morning, the manna fell, and then it closed again. It's nice. That's how the way they imaged it. Okay. So, so therefore, Moses was opening the treasury of manna in heaven. All right. When Israel finishes its 40 years in the wilderness, they cross the Jordan River. And the understanding was the treasury of manna closed and it would not open again. And when Messiah comes, this would be one of the keys to signal his arrival, the reopening of the heavenly treasury. So they're asking, well, okay, so our fathers ate this kind of heavenly bread. So what is it that you offer? Have you just reopened the treasury? Now, we have just seen a feeding miracle. We have just seen Jesus imply that he is fulfilling the Passover images. That's nice. That's very nice. But then Jesus pushes his audience to the next level, a third level. Jesus says, here's a surprise for you. Verse 35. It's not just that I opened the treasury in heaven. It's not just that manna has appeared once again in the world but I have come from the treasury of manna. The box has been opened and I have fallen out. So that is why he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. What? Wait a minute. I thought there was bread out there. I know about manna as bread, but now Jesus says he is bread. So John 6 is saying, it isn't just that Jesus replicates the old story, but now he is a character in the story. He isn't simply Moses, which would be a prophet who comes from below, from within humanity. But Jesus in the old story is the manna that comes from above. That must have blown their minds. So that is why Jesus says, okay, so therefore I am the bread of life. It isn't simply that if you believe in me, you're going to be saved. Oh no, it's much more complicated and rich than that. I am the bread of life. I have come out of heaven. And those who consume what comes from heaven, they're the ones who are going to have true life. Now, if you look at verse 41, their response is exactly what I would expect inside of the Passover story. What do they do in verse 41? They murmur. In verse 43, they murmur. They are groaning, they're murmuring, they're complaining, just like the Israelites did in the wilderness. Why are they murmuring? Because Jesus has just made an exalted claim. It isn't that he is serving bread, it's that he says he is bread. But Jesus pushes it even further. Verse 51, what is that bread going to be? It is going to be my giving my life for the sake of the world. That is going to be giving my flesh for the world. That is what I'm going to be giving this bread. Notice again, it's a pointer, a foreshadowing of the cross that is going to come later on. Now, you would think that's enough. That is enough to completely confuse their, his audience. He's fed 5,000. He's replicated the miracle of Moses. He now has made a divine claim to be manna himself. But then Jesus does the unimaginable. He pushes them to a fourth level. And I can't imagine anyone could even understand it. It's too much. Verse 652. How is it this man can give us his flesh to eat? 
Jesus says, truly, truly, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. These are amazing verses, 52 to 59. So Jesus says, you must drink my, drink my blood and eat my flesh. How, how do I understand this? There is no way to understand this inside of Judaism. Judaism strictly prohibited talk of cannibalism. There is no way, no framework to understand this except one. When Jesus is in the upper room, he is going to say when he breaks the bread and pours the wine, that this is my body broken, this is my blood poured out, and the cross is where you're going to see it. It is my altar. Therefore, inasmuch as you consume this bread and drink this wine, you are consuming me as a sacrifice, and that will give you life. Well, at this fourth level, Jesus has gone further than anyone imagined that he ever would. And at this fourth level, he's hinting that there is going to be coming from his cross a meal, and the consumption of his blood and body will be the elements that give us the life that we seek. Now, of course, you and I know you are in the audience with me reading the story. We are living inside of the church. We get this. But the people on stage listening to Jesus speak, I doubt they could understand it. And that is why we come to verse 16. And they're all murmuring. How can this be? How can you, verse 63, give us our, your flesh? How can you give us your flesh to eat? We don't do things like this. And then in verse 63, Jesus says the following. He says, look, it, flesh itself, sarks, the very substance of the thing, is not what's important here. But instead, it is the Spirit of God that you should pursue. The word, the Spirit of God. So, therefore, he says, it is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. So, what do we have? We have Jesus evoking memory of Passover. We have Jesus now evoking the imagery that is going to be used later in the church to represent his meal. And in his exhortation, he says, when you consume me, when you actually take this bread and this wine, remember that it's an encounter with the Holy Spirit that's most important. Now, I need to stand back and let you look at this from 30,000 feet. Because we suggested when we studied John chapter 3 that it is the most explicit description of transformation with water and with Nicodemus. The water there comes close to being a remarkable reminder of baptism. And so likewise in John chapter 6 here, we have a very close description of bread and wine and body and blood that speaks to us of the Lord's Supper. But in chapter 3 and in chapter 6, the same thing happens. Jesus says, it's not what you think that's important. It is the Holy Spirit that you will encounter in your use of baptism and in your use of the Lord's Supper. It's the Spirit that makes all the difference in the world. Now, this is why many Christians who have studied the Gospel of John find their explanation for something. Why doesn't John record the Lord's Supper? Why doesn't he give an explicit reference to baptism? Because in these two chapters, we have what we could describe as his critique of those two, um, two symbolic rituals. Because in both cases, John wants us to know that it's not just repeating a symbolic meal that's important, it's an experience with the Holy Spirit that is above all important. Now, the, the chapter ends with something that um, we also don't expect. Because <clears throat> I suggested that when the light comes into the world, it scatters the darkness. And I suggested that in John's Gospel, whenever the light penetrates the world, it immediately sifts those who encounter it. There are some who move toward the light, and there are others who retreat into the darkness. All right, we understand that now. But when you come to the end of John chapter 6, something else happens that we didn't expect. There are interested people who have come close to Jesus, and they're listening carefully. They have stayed with him, but now he is saying something that is so difficult. Jesus' revelation here in John chapter 6 even divides that audience. Jesus' identity is so profound that many can't even handle it. Take a look at verse 66. Many, even of his disciples, disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. What? Now, we're not talking about people who are in the darkness. We're talking about disciples who are approaching the light. But the depth of Jesus' identity is even too much for them. So Jesus said to his 12, do you also want to go away? And Peter says, where are we going to go? Because Lord, you are the only one with eternal life. John wants us at this stage of his story to understand that Jesus is not just another character in the Jewish narrative. Jesus is so profoundly different than anyone you have ever met that when you probe the depths of his truest identity, it will be hard for you. Sweet. That can, that, that'll conclude this stream. Yep. It's getting very late. All right. So God bless everyone, and we shall see you next time yep. for the cattle. All right. God bless.